Hello, everybody. Welcome to, I think this is episode seven. God, we're on episode seven already. Lucky number seven. Yeah. Well, as you can hear, I'm joined by a very special guest today. Uh, Wingy Media joins me. Hello, everyone. Uh, so hello to, to yourself as well, <laughs> obviously. Hello, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, obviously, we're both Doctor Who YouTubers. You know, don't doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to figure that out. Just have a look through both our content libraries. By the way, I'll link your channel in the thingy description, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, cool. I doubt you'll get many new subscribers from me, but if you well, do. You never know. I mean, it's I, always a plus. I mean, I'm an old whore. I'll just accept anything. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Any subs I can get. Yeah, that's the same with me right now. I find that YouTube doesn't really tend to traffic me all that much. Like, I had one video that did well for me. Like, it was, like, 22K or something. Mm. But even that was, like, just by chance more than anything else. Like, I wasn't expecting it to, you know? Well, I think that's the main thing with YouTube, really. You can't really ex expect it to do stuff, because I always find... <laughs> I'm always going to be disappointed, because I, I think, just saying to you, just before we started recording this, like, I've done videos where I put so much effort into it, and it gets nothing, and then the opposite happens, where I put no effort in, and it gets loads of views, so yeah. it's it's a very fickle beast, is YouTube. It is, because I made a little bit of background on me, I made a resolution review where I got Bullstrek to cameo. Alright, okay. So I was expecting that to do gangbusters, you know what I mean? Because mm. I've got a big ish in the grand scheme of things channel uh you know with a pretty popular topic obviously doctor who and also the daleks being the most iconic villain yeah uh you know i thought this is you know probably gonna do well it, it did okay for me with about 400 odd views but I, I was expecting more than that but as you say you can't go in expecting things because you just don't know what's gonna happen yeah like you can try your best with with tags and things but oh, just... tags are a nightmare. I hate yeah. them tags. I spend so long typing them out, and then a lot of the time they're just a load of rubbish anyway. But yeah, they don't end up actually doing anything, or you know, sometimes the you'll think they're good tags, and then they just won't. You know, they're not very good. Luckily, there are like tools now that you can use to say, "Oh, this is a good tag. This is a bad one." Yeah. Well, you know, you just... <laughs> the funny thing is, I found myself once because I think it was like a underrated doctor who episodes video or something that i was doing and i was just like how deep do i go with these tags and i was just like hashtag absorb a lot well nobody's <laughs> going to be searching that so yeah I, I, unless yeah. unless your channel pub which in his case yeah that, like that's a fair point actually that's a very fair point yeah yeah because i make a lot of jokes to him all the time because we're pretty like we're pretty buddy buddy at the moment so it's a lot of absorb off jokes going on you know because like, of course you're going to. He's you've the got, guy yeah. who made you've, you've off. got to get them in there. You're not just not going to make a joke about it. Like, he asked me... He's got a... At uh, the time of recording, uh, he's made a Spider-Man fan film which releases tomorrow. Okay. Uh, but because I was Patreon, I got early access. Mm. And he asked me to do a review of it. And this is going to be a bit of spoilers, but might as well reveal it here. He's going to be playing the Doctor in my audios. Oh, wow. from here on out so yeah so it was mutually beneficial because he didn't want to review it himself because in, i think he said oh i can't do that myself because you know he, he, he wants a fresh pair of eyes on it so he yeah. got me so uh yeah but we've got quite a good working relationship at the moment as i do with most people i get on here you know i get on pretty well um you know obviously i did one with El Patron, that was a lot of fun. Uh, which you did as well. You did one with El Patron, I remember. Yeah, I, remember yeah, I did that. a video a while ago on his channel. Yeah. Um, and th see, the thing is, I mean, take everything out of, you know, the criticisms and viewpoints and everything, but all I will say about El Patron is that I had a nice chat with the guy. And yeah. whether we differ on things outside of who or relevant to who, it doesn't really matter. I'm very open to speaking to anybody. Because some people did criticize me for doing that. Um, yeah, and it kind of annoyed me because it's just like, well, I'm not just going to shut down somebody else's viewpoints. I want to hear it. Um, yeah, but in the end, we didn't really speak about anything that deep or anything that he really nah. like gets shit for. But yeah, like I say, 
Yeah. No, I understand. Like, I remember him telling me when he did that re- uh, interview with Billy Garrett John mm. that he didn't actually expect it to be like that. Yeah. He was very. It, he he was under the impression that it was a friendly sort of chat, but then like Billy Garrett John sort of went full on Terminator on him and just sort of kept hitting him with all these hard hitting questions, and it was just like he just wasn't ready for it. So that's why, you know, to many he came across badly because he just didn't expect it. It completely blindsided him, and you know I've I've always been like with whoever I've got on. You gotta be honest with your guests. Well, like yeah. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bring on someone that I disagree with and just like tell them that we're having a friendly chat and then just destroy them. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's just like it's just a bit of a dick thing to do. To be, you know, and that goes like for either side. But uh, I'll keep, I'm gonna move on a little bit because don't want <laughs> yeah, this. this could get heavy quick. We're only like five minutes in. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just move on a little bit. So I just wanted to ask, first of all, how you got into the show. I know you probably covered it on your channel, but it's kind of the format of my podcast. So if it ain't broke. <laughs> well, don't fix it. Exactly. Um, yeah, so pretty much as the series was coming out, like my parents watched it when they were kids and obviously it came back. So they were just like, oh, well, we'll see how this is. And then I just started watching it. I watched series one sporadically. I don't think I I don't distinctly rem- remember sitting down like week after week trying to check it out but I think it was when the empty child was being broadcast and that one just creeped me out so much and I was just like this is terrifying me but I can't yeah. stop watching it so then from that point on I was just very much hooked and then obviously we got a new doctor with David Tennant and then I realized that there was a classic series and I went back and bought dvds of that and started watching that and then yeah there's big finish and there's books and there's all sorts i mean literally doctor who is bigger on the inside yeah that's kind of the thing that doctor who does to you as well the way i'd like to think about it is you know with apple when you buy one of their products they sort of convince you to buy all the rest of them because they're all connected yeah i think that's kind of what doctor who is like you got and if you start watching the new series it entices you to go back and watch the older stuff like, with me, my first episode was The Next Doctor with uh, David Morrissey. Okay. And after that, the year after, I watched Tomb of the Cybermen. Okay. And, you know, I just, from there, I built up, you know, watching more and more episodes as it came out. So, you know, that's just how it happens, I think. Like, you just get get introduced to one part of it, and it just sort of, once it has you... It doesn't really let go. Well, no, that's it. Well, I mean, the thing is as well, because obviously there's a long period of time between each series, you kind of think to yourself like, yeah, but I want more. And the best thing about Doctor yeah. Who is there's always more. Like, <laughs> it never runs out. It's impossible to catch up with absolutely everything Doctor Who related, like the Virgin novels or the Big Finish audios or the classic yeah. series, which not all of them even exist at the minute. Exactly, yeah. Um, so yeah you do just get swept up into it and then i found as well the spin-off shows like torchwood or sarah jane adventures not class that can fuck off um yeah <laughs> but all, all that stuff as well like you yeah you do just get yeah. swept up into it and i watched one episode of class and i was just like nah you're all right i yeah. watched the first episode Me i don't too. even know whether i got through the first episode at all. the only reason why i stuck with it in that first episode was because i knew that capaldi had a cameo and i was like right i want to see capaldi and then then i'm done yeah. and obviously he appears right at the very end so i had to sit through like 50 minutes of shit just to get two minutes of my favorite doctor yeah. from the new series so i mean you know who really wanted a Coal Hill School spin-off? Like, I don't feel like anybody wanted that. No, nobody... It doesn't make sense. It doesn't justify being a spin-off, like... I mean, a location if Ian was one show. of the teachers or something, that would have been kind of cool. You know, I don't... I mean, I know they might have had to get another actor, but, you know, something like that would would have been cool. Or well, maybe, yeah, you know, maybe, like, relatives of Ian and Barbara or something like that. Or Probably if they set up the, the story series. of class in a Doctor Who episode, so I think the Doctor, like, saves two of the characters in it. Why didn't we yeah. see that in, I think it was, like, Series 9 that had just come. So, yeah, why didn't we see that story in Series 9, so then at least you have some sort of connection to it, but yeah. instead it was literally just like, oh, yeah, here's a spin-off, by the way, that nobody asked for or cares about. 
Forget your eighth Doctor spin-off that you all desperately want. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, let's just set it in a random building that has got some mild attachment to Doctor Who. Which, as as the eighth Doctor is my favourite Doctor, so I'm dying for an eighth Doctor spin-off still, especially after watching Night of the Doctor. Yeah. And Klaus was basically just a kick to the balls. It was like, you know... (laughs) Yeah. You don't get the eighth Doctor spin off that you want. You get this completely unrelated thing that isn't even that well written. I don't think they're ever going to do that eighth Doctor series, to be honest, which is a shame. Yeah. But I suppose the only way I can see it happening is if Doctor Who goes off the air for a significant period of time again. And so yeah. they just think, oh, well, instead of casting a new Doctor, let's just do stuff with this guy. And yeah, that, I would love that. Yeah, Especially considering that with Big Finish, it's so expensive that I can't listen to a lot of the the Eighth Doctor stories that I would like to. Mm. Like yeah. I would, re- I'd love to listen to Dark Eyes, but you look take one look at the price for the whole thing, and you're like, okay. Yeah, that is the frustrating thing. I do wish that they'd. I th- well, I, I heard something about the streaming them on YouTube or something like that. I don't know how true that is, or if I've just made that up, but. I hope they do make them more accessible to people because I mean I only have a handful of them and you're right yeah. the prices of them are ridiculous and it's like I, I've got to be able to afford food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, you know, Eighth Doctor audios aren't gonna aren't gonna put food on the table. You know, you are right. Well, I can use um, some toasters, but that's about it, really. Yeah, like I would love to get in more into Big Finish, and I've listened to a handful of stories, and I mean a handful. You know, I, I can remember getting one set that was, I think it was all about the Bash Generada. Okay. And it was like... Is that with uh, Tom? Uh, yeah, there was one with Tom. Yeah. And there was one with McGann as well. Right. Uh, and I also remember a Sixth Doctor one with the Carrier Knights from that uh, Shakespeare episode. I think I remember this box set. Because they yeah. advertised it like Old old Doctor's New Monsters or something like that. I, I, Problem I is, I downloaded it onto one of my old phones and I haven't been able to find it. Oh, I probably didn't gutted. transfer them over, which sucks. Gutted. Yeah. Because I'd love to listen to them again, you know. Yeah. Which is kind of part of the reason why I wanted to do my own audios, was I sort of was like, there's a gap in the market because there are people who want more Doctor Who, mm. but they don't necessarily want to pay all of that money to to listen to more Doctor Who, so you know that's where I sort of got the idea for it. Yeah, well, and that's it. And uh, obviously, I've had to recast my Doctor, but you know, having Channel Pub on board is great. You know, he's helping me pen his introductory story as well, so should be good in theory. <laughs> you <laughs> well, know, I just have to see how it goes. I mean, the best thing is with audio, and I suppose with comic books and normal books as well is the fact that you don't necessarily have to worry about a budget so you don't have to worry yeah. about it looking terrible like a lot of the classic series did and to That's be fair a lot the of the new series because yeah. um, you can because it's like i've been reading scratch man at the minute um the tom baker's story that he's yeah written. i've heard about it i just again haven't got it <laughs> no I, I, love- I only picked it up because it was on offer and i was i was just like yeah do you know what i may as well pick it up um, and because yeah. it's like, well, I, I travel a lot, um, and train Wi-Fi and bus Wi-Fi is terrible, and I don't want to yeah. use data all the time. So I was just like, right, well, I'll pick this up, and like other comic books as well. Um, and I started reading it, and it's just honestly so so good. Um, mm. And there's stuff in it because I think the first half feels very much like a normal Tom Baker story, but then the second half is just batshit crazy. And the first page of like the second half of it i was just like yeah they could not have done this with the bbc's budget like there was no, no. way in hell it's it's really good the fact that we do have alternate things like books or yeah. what have you so we can tell proper doctor who well not proper doctor who stories but more expansive doctor who stories that aren't restricted by the quarries in ealing or wherever yeah and it's kind of the same with uh from what i understand the time war big finish ones because you honestly i don't think you can do the time war justice on television no. i just don't think you can they tried it in day of the doctor and it basically just looked like every other sci-fi battle ever pretty much you know? yeah and it was like you know i thought it was cool when i first watched it but back then i would kind of watch anything with doctor who on a logo i was kind of one of those people but then, like, over time, I started looking at it more critically, especially when I was watching more content creators as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, 
that partially influenced my more critical view of the show in particular. And other and other pieces of media, but obviously, you know, I liked it at the time, but I now realise what a missed opportunity it was, because the Time War is so much more than just a battle. Yeah, and that's it, you know, there could have been some really interesting political things in that. I yeah. feel like because um, I mean, there's. I think Russell has said subsequently that glimpses of the Time War are in the classic series, like with hindsight. Yeah. So Genesis, yeah, he is supposedly Genesis. like, yeah, it's supposedly like the trigger for the Time War, and then he said that you could view maybe bits of resurrection of the Daleks as hints at it, and mm. bits of remembrance as well. And looking at it like that, it really could have been like a a big political war film i suppose yeah i'd have loved it if they had done something like genesis where neither side was good yeah that's something i love about genesis is it's like the thals who were traditionally these aryan perfect beings were just as bad as the carlets yeah i do like and, that about genesis and that was that was a really cool idea I love stories like that as well, where there isn't mm. necessarily somebody to root for. Caves of Androzani, I think, is another story like that, mm. where because the, the only people that you care about really is the Doctor and Perry. Everyone else is a prick. And I, I just love that. I love yeah. stories like that. Vengeance on Varos, I would argue, is another one. Yeah, that is another one, and that's another. That's probably Colin's best story, in my opinion. Yeah. So. Fun fact: I actually got it signed by Colin, which was awesome. Oh, cool. Because. Uh, that was really cool when I actually because he was at Cardiff Comic Con uh, I got it signed and he was in a Cyberman Hawaiian shirt I met this... him in that exact same shirt really? <laughs> it's it's the uh, not Silver Nemesis the Nightmare in Silver Cyberman on his shirt yeah yeah, that's yeah, it, yeah. yeah. yeah oh my god I got him to sign um, the two Doctors because I couldn't find any other one <laughs> I wanted him to sign Attack of the Cybermen funnily enough um, oh, but right. I, like, I like two Doctors as well so I was like yeah get that one done I do need to watch more Six Doctor because I love Vengeance on Varos. Like, it's one of my favorites from the classic era, along with obviously Tomb of the Cybermen, Remembrance, Genesis, uh, you know, all the classics in that yeah. regard. You know, um, so as well as Doctor Who, obviously, you're you're a YouTuber. So, like, mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about how you got into the whole YouTube space. Um, well, it was just watching other people, I suppose. Not not just like Doctor Who content just all sorts really and i just thought to myself one day like do you know what why don't you do that um, yeah and then it just got to a point where like i'd set up my channel and everything but i didn't upload on it for like two years because i wasn't confident enough same yeah well i mean i was a lot bigger as well so i, th I was worried that like, if i get hate comments people are just call gonna call me like a fat prick or something i mean i'm already ginger and partially blind and have to wear glasses so i didn't want a third thing <laughs> Um, so it's just ginger <laughs> hair and glasses now that people can take the piss out of. Um, but yeah, so then I got the confidence and I you know, bought myself a couple of cameras and editing software and all the you know typical things that you'd need. And I, I remember my video, the, the very first one, took about two or three attempts to do because um, I was so j just shy within myself. Because it's like yeah. when you see other people, because I was watching like other channels do the thing and I was just like... It just seems so natural to them, and it's not until you actually do it and you start just talking to a camera that yeah. <laughs> you realise how weird it actually is. Um, yeah. But I just, yeah, like I say, there was just quite a few people that I thought I like what they do. I like um, them as a person, but I don't necessarily agree with everything that they say. So I was just kind of like, I'll get my opinion out there and I'll get my viewpoints yeah. out there and. But this was this was in the time where having a different opinion was acceptable. Yeah, exactly. Where, where people were allowed to have different opinions without being branded something. Yeah, exactly. And to be honest, that was kind of a turning point for me because I distinctly remember for the first few months that I was sort of holding back somewhat. Mm. And it wasn't until the reveal of Jodie Whittaker and I made a video about it and I just got so much shit saying, how dare you say that, I'd, you know, you don't like her immediately and... You know, you're just yeah, a exactly. sexist, you're a bigot. And after that, I was just like, that's absolute horse shit. Like, none of that is true. So after that, I was just like, you know what? Fuck it. I don't care what people think. I'm just going to say what I think. And if people don't like it, then tough. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm a big boy now. Like, I can deal <laughs> with criticism. You know, you get people in the comments all the time who are knobheads or 
You do, yeah. I've had a couple of death threats as well, but it's just like, seriously, I'm just some guy on the internet. Why are you so offended by what I say? Talking about Doctor Who of all things, it's like, yeah. it's really not that. Yeah, that's it. And and that video, he... that video that I did, sort of reacting to Jodie's casting, it's not on my channel anymore. Um, yeah. But at the time, that's how I felt. And I think what some people didn't seem to realise is that in that video, I suggested ways that they could potentially do it in a way that I would actually like. Yeah, I did as well. Yeah, like, and I also said stuff like, um, this is just my initial opinion. I haven't seen anything yet. I haven't seen any trailers. I haven't seen how she's going to be dressed. I don't know anything about her series. This is just an initial reaction. I want to be proven wrong on this. Yeah. And yet people just ignored that and just focused on... They just see what they negative. want to see, don't they? they yeah, just exactly. See the part that they want to see like i even said you know in in my videos when i was first starting out you know in theory like there's nothing wrong with a female doctor it's just are my preferences for the doctor to be a male character because that's how it's always been like why ch it, again if it ain't broke don't fix it yeah. but also i didn't rule out the possibility that it could be done well you know because yeah, i haven't exactly. seen jody in anything uh so i thought she might be all right chip no i was more worried about the whitaker honestly because yeah, I was as well. <laughs> Still am. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. How he got that role, I've got no idea. Well, it still me, perplexes me. It was kind of obvious for me, just because he was somebody who wrote on the show before, and I, I think it was either between him or Mark Gatiss that was going to do it. I don't think. I really wish that they would have got somebody like Charlie Brooker, for example, who is a known Doctor Who fan. Like, I, I wish they would have got him. Like, can, I've recently been catching up with Black Mirror. And some of the stuff that he writes, I just think, imagine what you could have done with Doctor Who. Or yeah. maybe even um, Rhys Shearsmith and Steve Pemberton, because obviously I... they do Inside Number 9, and that's fantastic as well. Mm. And again, they're Doctor Who fans. So If I had any choice for showrunner, like, this is just like pie in the sky dream, I'd go with Dan Harmon, who does Rick and Morty. Because oh, okay. I feel like his him and his team are so creative. Yeah. I see. And like, some of those ideas are so out there. Like, can you imagine what he could do with, like, Doctor Who? He could take it to places that you couldn't even think of conceivably. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a fan of Rick and Morty, but I do agree with that. Like, from like, what I have seen of it, it is quite outlandish and whatnot. And I'm, that's exactly what you want Doctor Who to be, really. But And when you boil it down as well, Rick and Morty is a very, very similar premise that takes a lot of inspiration from Doctor Who. Well, yeah, that's it as well. So it, it, it's not like he wouldn't understand the formula or anything. Exactly. You know, it would just... I think it would, he would be perfect, but that's just my like pie in the sky dream. Personally, I'd have taken Toby Whitehouse over Chris Chibnall. Yeah, like I think he would have been a better fit, honestly. Well, with Chibnall, I was kind of hoping for a reverse Moffat in the sense that Moffat was amazing and then he took over. I was hoping with Chibnall because he wasn't great before he took over. Maybe he might he... be good as the get head guy. Yeah, I but I mean, what I will say is his run isn't over yet so no. it might be a mccoy thing where the first series is just really not great and then it gradually gets better but at this point because the latter half of moffat's run for me at least i didn't enjoy overall no. and now we've got another series that i don't enjoy i'm just starting to think to myself like why am i still putting myself through it's kind this? of like yeah i had a similar thing to you because you stopped sort of watching actively in series nine didn't you i nearly did yeah because I he I had that down. that period in series nine where I just stopped, like series nine was so bad to me, and this was when Capaldi was still the Doctor. Was, Capaldi's a great actor. Yeah, and even then I was like, Nah, you're all right. Particularly with stuff like Hellbent, oh, uh, yeah. which that, I that was you, the point for me. Yeah, like I can remember you doing a video on it, and that whole regeneration of the general, like that also really sort of open my eyes to sort of stuff that you know was trying to sort of say and push in a way and uh, you know obviously without getting too deep into that like that sort of really you know ticked me off basically yeah i know what you mean it it was that was something that did kind of get me and it's like with missy as well it was obvious that they were trying to lean it more towards like we're going to do a female doctor and look if they'd have done a female doctor after David Tennant, 
or after Matt Smith, I don't think that it would have been as big of a deal. No, but I think it would just be. because of the the hyper political climate that we live in, I think if they did anything other than cast a woman, it would have been sacrilege. Um but then again you get those same people as well who when they saw Jodie Whittaker, they moan saying, Yeah, but the doctor's still white. And that's yeah. kind of the world that you, we're living that's in the now. Thing. Where you people can never are so please hung up on that. You can never please like with certain people, if you try to please them, it'll never be good enough. Exactly. Like, like I could remember people complaining about Resolution because they introduced a gay character and he was killed off. I remember that article. I think I retweeted yeah, it. Yeah, like, and they were all going, oh, you killed him off within eight seconds. And I was just sat there thinking, well, why did he have to be gay to begin with? Yeah, I have seen that scene. It is a bit random how he just mentions his sexuality. I, I don't know. Um, oh, I forgot you stopped watching after episode 10. Yeah. Episode. Yeah, but I, I did I, I did see that clip because obviously news out, outlets were reporting it and whatnot. But, I mean, if anything, it just shows that Daleks aren't bigots because they'll kill anybody. <laughs> they're not going to discriminate against you. You're dead either way, unless you're a Dalek. <laughs> that's but. quite good. Yeah, that's good. Nah, uh, I suppose we're sort of transitioning into the current state anyway. Mm. I feel like our viewers line up pretty well uh, when it comes to Series 11. Like... It's one of those things that it's kind of like for me. It's sort of like a car crash. That you know, it's you know, it's terrible. You can't, but you can't look away. Yeah, and it's kind of like that. Like you know, what you're seeing is horrible. Yet you still want to look. It's kind of like that for me. Then again, having said that, I haven't reviewed Battle Around Score of Colos yet, and I sat down to watch it the other day, and I I like couldn't sit there and watch it. It was one of those things that was so boring that it just didn't hold my attention at all. I couldn't, um, I couldn't believe that that was a finale. No, me neither. I was like, really? That's your own game? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean... The thing is with Series 11, like, I went into it wanting to be proven wrong. Like, I oh, wanted I did as well. to enjoy I it. it. Um, and the, the real frustrating thing is, every sort of worry that I had... Well, not everyone, but a lot of the worries that I had were there and i was just like oh but why because people always say about um oh but doctor who's always been political and yes it has yeah nobody's stupid enough to deny that or if they are then well they're stupid as i say but anyway doctor who has been political before and it's done it to such great success yeah but what came first and foremost was a good story yeah nowadays what you've got is it seems that they're just like right what can we talk about today? I know Donald Trump's relevant. Let's do a, a mockery of, of him and then also have like this side plot of spiders and whatnot. That was ridiculous. And, like, and it's like, it, look, I'm in no way a Trump supporter, but it's getting no. boring now. Like, seeing all the parodies of it. It's like, yeah, we get it. You think he's a dickhead. Most people like, think he's a dickhead. I, as well, like, like yeah, I can remember it. someone saying to me, oh, a Trump supporter. Like, I'm in Britain. I couldn't give a toss about American politics. That's the thing that gets me. Americans seem to think that we give a shit about Donald Trump or anything that he does. We really don't. We've got our own things to worry about. We've only just got rid of Theresa May, for Christ's sake. We've got bloody Brexit. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. We've got all this stuff. We're not worried about the annoying orange over there. Exactly. Um, And that's why why does Doctor Who need to comment on Donald Trump as well? That's what I don't get. That's the same thing I found with Rosa. I just didn't think it was the right place. Like... You know, I'm not saying, no, it should never be said. I'm saying, was a sci-fi show meant for family really the right place to say it? Well, I mean, uh, Doctor Who has tackled racism before. But it has. Again, like it I say, it it's, do- it's, that, it's done it in better ways. It did it, like, in a way that was subtle. And it did it in a way that was, you know, it, it didn't feel out of character for the show. Whereas Rosa felt like a completely different show to me. Like, at points, it just sort of felt like an ITV drama. Yeah. And that's kind of not what I want with with Doctor Who, to be honest. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, Doctor Who should be impactful and it should be hard-hitting every now and again. But I think that was a bit of a misstep for me because I just thought, I know what you're trying to say, but all this boils down to is racism is bad. And it's like, yeah, most and people think, get that. <laughs> like, 99% it's so, it's so of people get that. as well, which is what sucks, like... Like an example, I always like to use is Remembrance of the Daleks. Yes, was, Remembrance of the Daleks tackles of. racism, but it does it in a way that not only makes sense for the Daleks, but it ties into real-world racism in a far more clever way. 
Yeah. Because it draws parodies between the Dalek sense of racism and also, obviously, humans. Yeah. Um, but again, that's what I mean. It did it in a way that was subtle, in a way that, like, it didn't feel like it was beating you over the head with it. Whereas yeah. with Chibnall, it's like he's trying to shove it down our throats. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I, I will say this. It isn't just Chibnall, because I do think the Zygon episode in Capaldi's era, that was oh, another yeah, one was for me where episodes. I was just like, uh... But like I say, politics has a place in everything, everywhere. It, but like, like I said, it is all about the execution. But nowadays, I feel as if because people are so, well, like I say, we live in a hyper political world that if you don't beat people over the head with it, people will just be like, well, you didn't go far enough with it. And I'm just yeah. like, at the end of the day, it's not that deep. It's a TV show. Like, it, it's supposed to be daft and stupid and it does all these silly things and there's big rubber monsters and we go to some quarry down south or wherever <laughs> yeah and it, it is about that and yes tackle those issues as well but just first and foremost write something good like there's no point in trying to be impactful if the actual way that you're trying to be impactful is no good like the message isn't going to outweigh the quality if that makes yeah. sense so like as you said you know what did rosa really say racism is bad like okay it's not as if we didn't know that already <laughs> you know yeah. we've had countless pieces of media saying that exact same message for decades like if you'd have brought something new to it i'd be much more forgiving or if you'd have tackled it in a much more clever way uh maybe perhaps i don't know have it take place somewhere else and have them be like aliens that are you know basically what remembrance did is what i'm saying yeah uh, you know that would have been much better but no they had to like make it like so obvious and, you know, I'm, I'm happy for the people who learn about Rosa Parks through that episode. Oh, yeah, me like, too. If, if if you didn't know about Rosa Parks and you learnt about it through that episode, then fair enough. I'm not going to argue with that. But, again, I suppose when you're a fan of the show, like, you expect more from it, is my mm. point, I think. Like, you expect it to be more. And it should have been more. And it wasn't. And that's the thing that annoys me, I think. Yeah, because I, I think that is the most frustrating thing about Series 11 for me, is I can see what they're trying to do, yeah. but they never stick the landing. Um, no. Even in an episode like Kablam, for example, um, which I thought was the best episode of the series, yeah. where at the end it's like the twist of the kid is actually the bad guy, and it's not the corporation, and it's like, you're really getting your message mixed up here, because I thought you were trying to hint that big corporations are bad, but now you're saying that they're not, and it's just employees, and uh, that was a real... <laughs> and Jody literally killed him. Yeah, it's yeah, and that well, Jodie's doctor's all over the place anyway. One episode yes. she's a certain way, the other episode she's a totally different. She thing. even addresses it in Battle Around Score Out Collar. She says, "Oh, my rules change all the time," I know. and I'm just like, and it, "Yeah, that uh, that seems like a very convenient way to dodge, like you know, for some lazy writing." You know, what it I mean? is very much a kind of like oh, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey type thing, which is like, eh, or the rule one, the doctor lies. Yeah, but. Or is, are you just being lazy? Is that what you're doing here? Like, I mean, I know the Doctor lies, but I always thought he had a very, you know, defined sense of morality. I thought, you know, with each incarnation, you could kind of understand what each one thought was right and what each one thought was wrong. Yeah, the, the morals I are felt very that clear. anyway. But with Jodie, I don't really know. Because in one episode, she's willing to let a spider die in pain. But in the next episode, she won't let Bradley kill Tim Shaw. It's like... For which one is it? Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, that's another thing as well. I talk about mixed messages. Like, Arachnids in the UK, where it's like, oh, no, we must protect them, and, you know, we can't be harmful, and there was, like, an anti-gun message in there as well. And it's just like, so you'd rather let this poor thing suffocate? Is that more <laughs> exactly. cruel? Like, but I think most people have kind of acknowledged that one. But, again, it, it is just that inconsistency, and I think Jody as well is probably not at the forefront for the most of the series in terms of i mean she might have the most lines of dialogue i don't know but she doesn't feel like she's the lead in the show she doesn't feel like she's yeah. at the forefront or no, is I agree in charge with you. um and that I, I, maybe it's because she's got too many people around her i don't know but i just feel I like feel the series like that swallowed might be part of it i feel yeah. like that might be part of it to some extent but i can remember someone i can't remember who it was now but someone said she's like the one with the car She's she's only friends with these people because she's the one with the car. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if Bradley had a time machine, I don't feel like they would be friends. <laughs> you know? 
I, it was very I, random how they got together as well, where it's just sort of like, oh, well, you're on this train. Are, are we mates now? Like, oh, no. Like, <laughs> Yeah, like, for example, with, like, Amy, for example, in the 11th hour, they built up that relationship through, you know, like, 14 years. Yeah. Like, you understood why she was obsessed with him, because it, it was stemmed from childhood. <laughs> Whereas with this lot, it just feels like, well, I've got no else to do. Like... <laughs> Yeah, might as I'll well. go with you. I mean, I might get killed because you clearly don't know what you're doing and your morals are flipping every five seconds, but sure, why yeah. not? And everyone just, like, blindly obeys her. Like... <laughs> yeah, that is another frustrating thing because obviously you want the companions and the Doctor to get on, but you do need that sort of conflict there. And I think yeah, exactly. the best Doctors and companions do that with each other. So you see multiple times, for example, with Ace and the Seventh Doctor where they clash over things or you know ace isn't truly well ace doesn't truly have faith in the doctor like curse of fenric is a prime example of that and um leela and the doctor the fourth doctor yeah. would, would clash on different stuff and I, and I do miss that dynamic really because it does sort of feel like this is the doctor they're perfect well yeah. no they're not and the doctor then never again, has if, been if they portrayed jodie's doctor as any as anything but perfect you know what the reaction would be yeah that's a it fair point be, how dare you make him like this? The other ones weren't like this. Is it because she's a woman? You, you could just see that coming from a mile away. Uh, yeah, that that is something. Because I always am a firm believer, you know, the whole Mary Sue thing, or Gary yeah. Sue, because it does apply to male characters as well. Some people don't seem to realise that. Um, what makes a character truly strong is when they're vulnerable. And it's yeah. how they get through that. And I don't see that with a lot of characters on TV or in movies now purely because I think some people will be like, well, that's offensive, that's a stereotype, that's this, that's that. And I'm just like, stereotypes do exist for a reason because there's some truth into them. Not all the time. And I'm, you know, I'm not... Like, a great example is Tony Stark. Like, yeah. you know, think about it, Tony Stark is literally just a guy with a suit and money. But what makes him so interesting is that he is probably the most vulnerable Avenger. Yeah. Like, he's the one who would die the easiest. Like, well, I suppose you could argue that Black Widow and Hawkeye would probably not fare very well. But um, you, there's an argument to be made that he, he stands among gods and things and super soldiers, and he's just a guy. Yeah, well, he hides um, behind his tech, doesn't he? But And, and he is vulnerable, because obviously we have it in like Iron Man 2, I believe, where I think it's the arc reactor gets removed, and he's like really struggling to survive. Was it Iron Man 2 or Iron Man 3? It was one of those. Yeah, I think in Iron Man 2 he's getting poisoned by it, and then I think in Iron Man 3 he's got like the PTSD from the events of the first Avengers film. Yeah, but that's what I mean. That's what made him yeah. so interesting, was that he was more vulnerable than the majority of them. You know? Because, like, Thor, you feel like he could uh, destroy pretty much anything in an afternoon. But even with Thor, obviously in Ragnarok, uh, Mjolnir yeah, was destroyed. Yeah, and they make it—they literally strip everything away from Thor, like his hair, his family, <laughs> his hammer, everything he loses, and that's what makes him compelling going into Infinity War, and that's yeah, when exactly. you start to root for him because I, I think Thor was probably one of the most boring characters in the MCU. Oh, definitely, without until, a doubt. Until Ragnarok, and that's the movie for me that I finally see Thor the way that he should have been seen in the first place, and. Yeah, like I say, that's what makes a character great and strong is the fact that they have hardships, they have, you know, issues and they go through certain things, but it's how they come out on the other side. It's not just being, well, I'm amazing. It's, that That's boring. That's why it wasn't until Man of Steel that I actually found Superman an interesting character because I always thought he's the, you know, he's the picture perfect poster boy. He can't do anything wrong. You know, he's got all these powers. But then in Man of Steel, he's so vulnerable and he doesn't really know what to do with himself because he's got all of these powers and he's got so many burdens and a lot of people give that film shit but yeah like, i think one of the best bits in that film is where he breaks sod's neck that. like personally i find man of steel i just find superman too dark honestly you can make him vulnerable without making everything dark and gloomy around him yeah that that um, is true but that's just my personal thing on it like i will say like if man of, if superman actually existed it's probably the closest to what he would actually be like. Like, he wouldn't yeah. just be this god that got everything right all the time. He would make mistakes. Uh, 
because at the end of the day, I know he's not human, but he grew up as a human. Yes, and it is that conflict between his humanity, in inverted commas, and him being a Kryptonian. And th- that's what I found really compelling. Um, yeah, exactly. And I can definitely understand that. But like at the moment, everyone just seems to be afraid to make anyone like vulnerable at all. Like A good example is Rey in Star Wars. Yeah, that is a good example. She just seems to be able to do anything anyone else can do with no training whatsoever and And, you're like why yeah because you do see things like that and you're just like one why can she do that two this is boring and three i don't care where she ends up because she's not going on a character journey where she started off is exactly where she's going to end up yeah and i didn't like her too much in force awakens either because at least in force awakens uh she was getting attacked by raiders and she was struggling you know, so at least that showed a bit of vulnerability. But from then onwards, she's just perfect in every way. She takes on Kylo Ren, a seasoned Sith, or like a seasoned, you know, Force user, and he's proficient with a lightsaber, and she beats his ass. And you're like, how? I know that. I mean, the, the thing that I always say to people who are just like, oh no, but it's fine. You know, that works in Force Awakens. Yeah, but picture a New Hope. And in that scene after Obi-Wan gets taken down by Darth Vader, imagine if Luke picks up his lightsaber and then just beats the shit out of Darth Vader. Like, that is not a... That wouldn't be good. <laughs> and that's essentially what happened in The Force Awakens. Yeah. And it's it's just not interesting and it's not compelling. And you look at a character like Wonder Woman, for example, I think they did her really well. Yeah, I do. I do she I agree. has a lot of weaknesses in that film, but it's how she overcomes them. Because they made her naive as well, which is something I really liked. Yeah. She didn't have all the answers. She she had a very, like, traditional view on good and evil. Mm. But she, by going to World War Two, she realised that it wasn't as black and white as she thought. Yeah. And I thought that was a really good message. And, and that was actually something that was empowering for females, was to see her run through no man's land like a boss. And, you know, just absolutely destroy everyone I think that it's was empowering action. for anybody though that's the thing i, I yeah. don't understand this uh, this idea that you can only relate to people that look like you and people are probably exactly. going to say to me well you know you're straight you're white you're a guy like you're represented everywhere but i don't look at it that way and i never no i don't one. either um because it's the way that i think about it is when black panther came out there was that whole thing of oh finally black people have a superhero that they can look up to and i just thought to myself but surely there's there's a young black kid out there who's being told oh aren't you happy that you finally got a superhero but he's probably there like but thor's my favorite or there's probably a white kid out there or an asian kid or pick a demographic yeah and they're just like why am i being told that i can't like black panther when he's my favorite character yeah like why can't i dress up as black Panther? (laughs) yeah and, and and things like that and that's the way that i think about it the more that you delve into identity politics and whatnot the more it it kind of falls apart for me yeah um, no you're right like if 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 i could only relate to people who look like me everyone would be in a wheelchair <laughs> like i mean admittedly it would be pretty cool to see some of those characters in wheelchairs but well that, like that's kind of like saying well the only superhero that you could look up to would be professor x from the precisely X-Men. and that's just not true like plainly and obviously, because like my favorite is Spider Man, always has been in every iteration. You know, uh, Spider Man's always been my favorite when it comes to the superheroes, and I don't see any disability there, unless you count glasses, I suppose. Well, maybe. I, guess. <laughs> I mean, I suppose you could argue it's a hindrance to an extent, but I wouldn't call it a disability necessarily. Well, Plus, it, you get it is for me if I, if I don't have them on. But <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying, and it is a shame that that's the point that we're at. And look, people do go through stuff, and people do, you know, they don't feel welcomed and, and things like that. But like I say, may, maybe I am naive, and maybe I just think that the world is better than what it actually is. But I, I, I'm a firm believer that it's who a person is, not <laughs> what a person is. That if, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. At. Really, uh, I think this whole idea that you know, everyone has to cater to everyone, just isn't true. And this whole idea that Jodie Whittaker is somehow revolutionary is bollocks. Yeah, that's one of the main things that kind of got me when people, you know, when she was first announced and there was the reaction, they were just like, finally, 
Doctor Who's diverse, and I'm like, whoa, hold the fuck up. Are you seriously going to say to me that, take their demographics out of it, are you seriously going to look at Peter Davison, Paul McGann, David Tennant, Tom Baker, and say that they're exactly the same? That's horseshit. Their demographics might be the same, but they're all <coughs> totally different. They all bring different <coughs> things to that role. So just to say that, oh, well, finally we're getting something new and different. Well, on the outside, maybe. And even if you took the doctor it. out of the equation, you got all the companions who've always come from different walks of life. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I th- the, the, ma- <laughs> the most annoying thing about the new series is all of them have been from similar sort of backgrounds. So you can look at, say, Donna or Martha, for example, who aren't the same demographic, and you can just be like, oh, well, they're different. But are they really? Because they do kind of come from, you know, working-ish class families, and they have issues at home, and uh, and they are very similar. Obviously, the way that they yeah. portray their respective characters isn't very similar, but in terms of their back their background they are quite similar yeah and even with series 11 like you know i know they're all different ethnic groups and different genders but they're all from the same place yeah exactly they're all from chatfield and yeah ryan and yaz are fairly interchangeable i mean bradley walsh is only slightly different but that's probably down to the fact that he's older that's the only real difference yeah you know i think the more you look into it the more you realize that nothing will ever be truly diverse, like what what some people want it to be. But personally, I don't want it to be that. (laughs) Can't we just get whoever's good for whatever we need? Yeah, I I just want genuine people. I I don't care. I don't care what walk of life you're from. I don't care, you know, what your shoe size is or, you know, your (laughs) hair colour or gender race anything like that it's not important tell a good story you know i couldn't care less if i saw nobody on tv who looked like me as long as they're compelling that's how i relate to a character i relate to people based on what they do not you know who they do for example or what they look like or anything like that you know that's just trivial to me and maybe like i said before maybe i am naive in saying that and maybe some people are just like well that's because you're from privilege but if that's the case i'd really like to see some of that fucking privilege that i'm supposed to have yeah i would as well like yeah exactly Uh, unless we're just both racist sexist bigots you know well that's probably what people are going to say they're probably not going to actually listen to what we're saying and they are going to just be like well it's just because you hate people yeah, well, that's the thing. Like, I know how I feel, and I don't have an issue with any... Look, if you're a dickhead, you're a dickhead. That's what I see, <laughs> you know? <laughs> exactly. Or if you're a nice yeah. person, of course, that's what I see. But yeah, you know, like, I get comments like, oh, you don't understand what it's like to be from a minority. But then I reply, but I am, though. And then their entire argument just sort of changes. It's like, well, you're still white. Yeah. Since when did skin colour mean anything? Well, yeah. yeah. I thought the whole idea was that you could do anything regardless of gender or skin colour or ethnic background. So why all of a sudden is being white such a bad thing? Like, why? Well, I just don't I mean, understand these arguments at no, all. I, I mean, look, things were bad in the past, but I don't think it's it's right to judge people now for things that happened or punish people decades, now. Yeah, well, yeah, decades ago. It's like painting people with the same brush and saying that, well, because you're this demographic and in the past people who look like you did a certain thing, like, yeah, but I'm not doing it. I'm not agreeing with what they did either. I'm, like, like, you I'm on your side say here. That people, <laughs> like, are different. people who aren't white never ever, never ever did anything bad. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not saying that, you know, everyone who's not white did anything bad. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying, like, you can't say that one one group of people is responsible for everything. Because yeah. that's basically what we did in the Middle Ages by saying witches were responsible for everything. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose yeah. Um, yeah but which, I, I which, wasn't, which I, Doctor Who even tackles very poorly. Yeah, that, that is true. But I, yeah. I, th- I think being a prick isn't discriminatory. I think if you're a prick, you're a prick. It doesn't really exactly. matter about any of that trivial stuff. Um, yeah. No. Nah. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Like, at the end of the day, just enjoy entertainment for what it is. Yeah. Ex- not for what you want to see in it. Like. Yeah, exactly. The, the, 
I mean, it's called entertainment. So that's the the focus of it. It should be entertaining first and foremost. And l entertainment can literally be anything. It can be funny. It can be dark. It can be dramatic. It can be sad. It c you know it can be all sorts of things. And you know put any type of person in there, and it'll still be those things if you write it properly. Um, and that's the thing with series eleven. When I boil it down, do did I actually find it entertaining? I would say no. You know, I didn't either. You can push all the great messages that you want, you know, hallelujah. Like, at the end of the day, did I enjoy watching it? No. So it's failed. Yeah. By sure. definition of entertainment, that is to entertain, <laughs> it failed because it didn't entertain me. And I feel like a lot of other people feel the same way. Yeah. You know, I don't, I, obviously, Series 11 clearly does have its fans. I'm not disputing that. But clearly it has its detractors as well, you know. So, by definition, it failed because it didn't entertain people. Yeah, that's well, like I say, it's all subjective. I mean, if it was me, even if it was like the worst possible thing ever, but I still enjoyed it, then that's okay. Um, yeah. And look, I never want Dog Theory to fail. I never want anything that I like to fail. You know, nope, I, 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 don't I, I don't want that e at all. But you know, if I'm not enjoying it, then I'm not enjoying it. Um, and at this current place and time it just isn't for me at the minute um yeah i want it to so, get better but i think I, I can't see it under chris chibnall um jody has her issues for sure the companions have their issues for sure but i think if you give them proper direction or you give them you know a character better, yeah and better writing and you know just better scripts to deal with then i guarantee that you could see a hell of a lot more out of them and a lot more people wouldn't be so negative towards this series because i think at this point the people who were genuinely bigots and were just like ah woman not interested those people aren't asked now they're gone no but i think the people who are still here and are disappointed are just like you've still got a decent cast there but you're doing nothing with them yeah. um, and i mean that's something that we had with capaldi as well like we had a, a phenomenal actor in the lead and yet barely was given anything I mean, that's my opinion. Obviously, some people might disagree. No, yeah, it was not. Obviously, I agree people you. are going to disagree. Capaldi but. was, you know, I feel like he was vitally underused. You get one of the best actors in Britain, in my personal opinion, and you give him this legendary role, and you gave him nothing to go with, you know, yeah. and it just sucked. Which is why I personally hope that Peter does do things like Big Finish in the future, which I have no doubt that he will. Oh, I'm sure he will. I mean, he's a massive Who fan, isn't he? So I think any opportunity that he gets to revisit it at some point, I'm sure he'll do that. I mean, let's just hope that big finish prices go down a bit. But <laughs> yeah, that's <'cause>, true. <laughs> as we said, it's it is it's ridiculously expensive. You know, I mean, collecting for the classic series is expensive enough. Like, yeah, certain, certain you know stories are quite expensive. Yeah, and that's saying nothing. Well. That that's saying nothing about all the Blu-rays and stuff, which I haven't even attempted to get because they're just they're also ridiculous as as much as the the recreations that they do and the new effects that they do i'm sure they're great like i can't justify spending that much on a on, the, on a series of doctor who from yesteryear yeah you know, i just you can't justify it as much as i'd love to have it it's one of those things you know yeah well because that's... they just uh announced the trial of the time lord season which isn't a season I've actually properly watched, and I'd love to watch it properly, but I don't know if you would. <laughs> uh, but nah, I know I know what you mean because it's like the season twelve one, which I think was the first one they did. Um, they did that in short print, so people bought multiple copies so they can go on eBay or on Amazon or anywhere, and they can sell it for like quadruple the price that it was released at, and it's just ridiculous ridiculous it's like i it luckily i managed to get one of them um because thankfully my girlfriend bought me one as like a, a present um but th yeah i mean looking at the prices of them now even a few months down the line like they just double in price and triple in price and it's just ridiculous yeah yeah you're absolutely right like i think that's the thing as well because like there's such a there's such a Demand, I find, for, for good Doctor Who at the moment, especially when we're in low periods like this. It was the same with Series 9, you know, people would basically take anything they could get. Yeah. Because, you know, 
you know, and this is another thing, like, people say to me, oh, you, you only don't like it because it's a woman or because it's chin or, or whatever, but I didn't like Series 9. In fact, Series 9 was when I uh, walked away or wheeled away, I suppose you could say, you know. <laughs> yes, I mean, Series 9 for me was almost a breaking point, but the only reason why I watched Series 10 was because I knew that Capaldi was leaving. That's literally the only reason. Yeah, I mean, um, I sort of looked at Series 10 with, like, one eye open. Yeah, me too, and I, I was hoping that that would be the series that would sort of rekindle my love for it, and I do like Series 10, just not that much. <laughs> um, no. I, I, it does I, have I, its good moments, obviously, yeah. the, the two, final two-parter is excellent. Yeah, um, I love World Nothing Time. The pilots, I'm a bit lukewarm on, the pilot's a decent start. Yeah, I quite like it's that. Just too I quite bad like that smile. We, it's just too bad we had a reboot season in Series 10, and then we're right back where we started again with Series 11. Yeah. You know, that kind of sucks. It was really weird marketing, of... though. The fact that they were just like, oh, yeah, well, you know, it's the pilot, and, you know, it's like a soft reboot, and you're leaving in, like, five minutes. Like, <laughs> why are you doing this now when you're all leaving? So it, 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 I mean, it would have been better if you did it in Series 8. But... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, I mean, I personally think that if there was a time the show should have ended, like, I would argue that Series 7 would have been a good time to cap it off. Like, after obviously, the I know... That Capaldi is great, but Capaldi's era does signify to me the downfall of the show, the slow decline of I, the show. Do you know, I'd even say it's part way through Matt Smith's era. I'd say it's that soon. But then again, I'm just a pessimist. And yeah. I don't know, but I mean, the, the thing is, Series 11, I don't even think is the worst series of Doctor Who. I'd say Sylvester's first season is atrocious. I'd say Series 9 is probably worse. Um, yeah. well, I, there's shit. even an argument for like series six. Yeah, uh, I'm not keen on that one either. Exactly. You know, there's there's series that I didn't particularly like, but at the end of the day, I could always rely on the characters that were there. Yeah, that's true. I could always say, oh, this one might not have been great, but at least the Doctor had like, some good lines, or there was some good character development, or something, anything. <laughs> like no matter how small, there was something there, but it's just not there. I mean, even Series 9, like, as much as I hated 12 and Clara, like, at least they had a chemistry or a dynamic that you could say that's their dynamic. Like, I can't say that with with um, Jody and her uh, fan, in quotations. Oh, yeah, I hate that she uses it's... that word. I know. It's... I never understood why the, why the Doctor used modern lingo. Yeah, I hate when he says mate. Or something like that, because it's just like, no, that doesn't work. Like the doctor should should say something like "old chap" or so, something like that. I, 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 don't I mean, like I kind of excused it with eleven because he was trying to act like a young man in an old, you know, he's a young, he was an old man in a young man's body. So yeah. I kind of sort of excused it there. I see what you mean, yeah. But with Jody, I'm just like, you're clearly just trying to do Matt Smith, and you don't understand why what Matt Smith did work. <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't understand why that worked. No, I don't know. Like, I hope it gets better, but... Oh, God, I've, I've always said I hope it gets better, but with all the news I'm seeing at the moment, I even made a video, like, top five reasons Series 12 is probably going to fail. Because it's just not that not enough change, I don't think, to to really make that much of an impact. Like, they're bringing the Jadoon back, whoop de doo Yeah. You know, like, that was a weird one. Like, I, I never understood that. Like, they made a big midnight announcement about the Jadoon. Like, what? It, I mean, yeah, if you're going to make a midnight announcement about the 8th Doctor series, that would be a different thing. <laughs> yeah. But no, the big news was that the Jadoon are coming back. Yeah, but this time like, they've got a hair. Well, Billy Piper about her coming back, and that never happened. Oh, um, I'm glad though. To be fair, I'm I'm glad to see the back of Rose. Series yeah. one Rose, phenomenal. Series two Rose can fuck off. Yeah, like I've never liked the Doctor having a romantic chemistry with the companion. I never, 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 never appealed to me. I I could appreciate that it got a lot of, you know, other people on board who are more into romance. But for me, I was just like, it never sat well with me that the Doctor was like 900 years old. Yeah, and Rose was like nineteen when it started. I yeah. was like, Ugh. yeah. When I you just, put it like that, it's a bit creepy. But it just doesn't sit well, you know. When you think about it like that, and I know that obviously, Tennant and 
Billy Piper are probably a similar age, but in the context of the show, he's supposed to be a 900-year-old alien, and she's supposed to be a 19-year-old girl from London, you know? That never sat well with me at all. Yeah, that doesn't really work. But I, I never really saw the Doctor as the type of hero that needed a romance. Yeah, um, he's, he, yeah. Because he gets a kick out of travelling around the universe and, you know, seeing different places and fighting the monsters and whatnot. Um, and I, I never really... Cause then, I mean, I always thought the only romantic relationship the Doctor should have is with the, the TARDIS. TARDIS. Yeah, I agree. Because um, he always seems like he's in love with... The, he even calls it Thea or an old girl and stuff, and it's like... That makes sense to me, because yeah. when you're with a ship for that long, I suppose you would gain an attached. It's like when you got a pet, and you talk to it, it's like, I know you can't understand me, but, you know, there's, there's you, you gain that attachment to it, you know? Um, and, you know, there's rumours that obviously they're going to do the whole Thasmin thing, oh, with yeah. the Doctor and Yaz, and, like, that would just... I mean, it's not even the fact that they're a lesbian as i said i just don't like the doctor having romantic relationships yeah also. No, I'd, yeah i'd just be against it if it was with ryan or graham or anyone really like because then you start to question the previous doctors and you start to think well well did john pertwee have a thing for joe grant or well did sylvester mccoy have a thing for ace or do, oh, do, do you know what i mean that. yeah but do you know what i mean you start to think about stuff like that then and it's just weird and it's wrong to me, yeah. um, but yeah, I mean, as long as it's good. But even then, I'll just be like, because eh, I mean, they fucked up Rose with the romance aspect. River Song started off as a really interesting character, and then she got really annoying. Clara yeah. and Matt Smith had this really weird thing, and Amy and the Eleventh Doctor as well had a bit of a weird thing. But like at least with Amy and the Doctor, the Doctor at least saw it as a bad thing. Yeah, and it like at least he didn't want like, any oh, part what do I do of it. Here? Yeah, you know, he I, wanted I them to that. be. He wanted them and Rory to, you know, make amends and whatever. That was nice. Yeah, he I think that's the way want... that they should handle it. As in, the Doctor's sort of just like, I've no idea what I'm doing here. Yeah, because in theory, the Doctor, even though he spends a lot of time with humans, he's still an alien. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, he's not going to completely understand human customs. Uh, I, at least I don't think, anyway, despite him spending a lot of time with them, he shouldn't be accustomed to them, you know, completely. No, and that, and that's what I liked about <clears throat> doctors like um, Tom or Peter Capaldi, is the fact that you do... Or Patrick, I would argue. Yeah, Patrick, Patrick. as well. Christ, I'd forget that. Um, the fact that they are very alien. Um, yeah. And the way that, even the way that they just walk or just enter a room, it's like there's... Tom like will pick up a glass of water and listen to it. Like that's weird and alien, yeah. and and that's the type of thing that I like from the Doctor. I don't like him just being all romantic and knowing what to do and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, and instantly knowing everything that was kind of, that that because that makes anything devoid of any tension. And it's that's it's even worse in series eleven because there's like such an over reliance on the Sonic as well. Yeah, but I mean, to be fair, that was a common problem with Matt Smith as well, and it was. But you'll notice that, particularly in Chibnall stories, even before Series Eleven, there was a lot of screwdriver usage. Oh, the like, Power of Three is the Power worst. of Three. They literally use it to fix the plot. Yeah, I mean, I love everything about the Power of Three, apart from like the last five ten minutes. Up till then, I was like, this is actually a really good story. This is really interesting. I mean, it is an interesting like, concept, these cubes that just sit there. Yeah, the slow invasion. That that was actually really cool, but... Uh, yeah, like you say, just wave the Sonic and then we're done with it. It's just As like, soon as uh, they introduce Cube Man... Oh, what... God, why was... What did he even do? <laughs> he didn't do... He was like budget Palpatine, wasn't he? Like, yeah. He even had like the little like voice that was all sort of... You know... All sort of, all sort of, you know, like slimy almost. Like what Palpatine had, where he was like, you know, that his voice was just disturbing, you know. Yeah, that, but that was that's something I noticed with Chibnall's writing is that the resolutions, no pun intended, <laughs> uh, are often very like convenient and wrap up very quickly. Yeah, like there's an example with. Uh, episode 10 
he basically just rips out pages of Stolen Earth at Journey's End and just sort of goes, there's my ending. Yeah, that's a fair point. I hadn't thought of it like that before. That's a fair point, actually. Because they literally just, you know, use the TARDIS to bring all the planets back. Which is weird, because Series 11 has longer episodes, on average, than the rest of Modern Who. But that's kind of the thing. It feels longer, but you don't actually get any more out of it. It still feels as rushed as some of the others. Because, I mean, there's some great stories, but they have a, you know, like a a rushed ending. But when I heard that, you know, the series was going to be shorter in terms of episode amount, but actually in terms of length, they were longer. I was like, ah, I I like that. That's actually quite good. But it doesn't really feel like anything's changed. It still feels like the episodes are still quite rushed. No, definitely. And as well, like, how much more was it? Like, five, ten minutes? If that. If that. And we missed out two episodes for the sake of five, ten minutes on the end. I'd have gotten rid of those five, ten minutes and had two extra episodes. Maybe you could have done something with them. Yeah, they have been a bit short-changed there, thinking about it. Um... Yeah, like, it's, it's almost like you've been ripped off. Like, you think you're getting a really good deal. Like, you see one of those signs that's, like, uh, you know, 80% off or something. But then right above it, it says 5 to 80% off. Or it's like up, <laughs> to, like up to 80%. So it might yeah, be like 80%, 80%, but it's probably like 3 Yeah, so they've got like the huge 80% in big letters, and then there's just a tiny little up there, so you, you can't see it. But, yeah, like, I'd much prefer more episodes to, you know, to try and flesh out these characters, rather than 5, 10 incon- inconsequential minutes. Like... I mean, there was an hour in Woman Who Fell to Earth. In theory, in Woman Who Fell to Earth, there should have been, like, you should have been able to get a strong sense of who all these characters were uh, in that hour. Well, I think the problem is the fact that there's so many of them, you don't really have time. Because it's like, you look at... They had to rush through it. Yeah. Like, you never see any of Graham's bus driver mates that they made a a deal out of in episode one. I forgot he was a bus driver. Yeah, he was. Because that's... Because remember in the Rosa episode, they say, oh, they say, oh, I hope you're not like that bus driver. That's what uh, Grace says to Graham. I hope you're not like that bus driver who forces Rosa Parks off the bus or whatever. Oh, yeah. That's kind of one of their, like, little dynamics, which is why Graham's so offended when Brian doesn't know what Rosa Parks did. You know. I've forgotten most of it already. <laughs> I, yeah, I, do, I wouldn't blame you. I think it's just because I pay too much attention. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I, I tend to check out if I'm not enjoying something. I will just be like, uh... But yeah. I can, yeah, I did that with quite a bit of Series 11. Like, I would say my favourite episode of Series 11 is Resolution, purely because of how, like, ridiculous it is. Mm. It's not good by any stretch, but it's kind of entertainingly bad whereas the rest of the series was just boringly bad you know i just can't get over that dalek and like i said i've not seen the full thing so i don't know it in context before anybody says but from what i've seen i'm just like that's that's terrible and like why does it have missiles coming out of its balls or (laughs) whatever and yeah i don't i mean that scene where it kills all the soldiers that's one clip that i've seen i'm like whoa that's actually amazing yeah that's but... probably one of the best scenes in series 11 if not the best scene well i've seen that so i don't need to see it now yeah i don't, just I don't, don't want to tarnished by anything else uh, one thing i will commend that episode for is it was the first dalek that didn't actually have a human inside it oh yes I heard it's an actual prop isn't it like that, remote which that was kind of cool admittedly yeah. And I think that actually adds a bit more to the Daleks, because with Daleks in the past, especially in the classic era, they were sort of so slow and trundly yeah. that it kind of took away the idea that these were sort of uh, manufactured war machines rather than just a guy inside a, inside a big pepper pot shaped you know, thing. Yeah, there is uh, a number of times in the classic era where Daleks are, I don't know, going up a corridor because... It's Doctor Who, of course, as a corridor. And, like, the yeah. lighting, you will sort of shine through the sort of grid in the mid-piece and you will see, like, a silhouette of somebody sat inside it, moving yeah. it about and whatnot. Um, it's like, you know, even when some of them move, you're like... You can tell that it's not with the accuracy or the precision that they clearly 
are meant to. Mm. You know what I mean? Because they're supposed to be these super accurate killing machines that never miss. Yeah, they do a yeah. lot, though. <laughs> <laughs> they do all the time. Kind of that stormtrooper thing where they're like, they're supposed to be these highly trained soldiers, yet yeah, they can never hear anything. Yeah, that does um, get me. But... And that was the same with those, what, they the bots from episode two? Oh, Series yeah. Leather, the bots. Yeah, weren't they supposed to be like the most accurate shooters in the universe or some over Jurassic yeah. bollocks that Doctor Yeah, all Jodie Whittaker had to do was go for a little jog and they could... <laughs> yeah, yeah, because she said, didn't she, like, they're tracking our movement or something like that. Yeah. Well, they're not, though, are they? Because none of you have been killed. Like, <laughs> this is... Sh- exactly. Yeah. It's it's so bad. It's so bad, but it's not even so bad it's good. It's just bad. Like, there's a great video by, by Nitpicks. I think I've Why seen Doctor it. Who is a mass one. Yeah, it's like an hour and a half or something, isn't it? I've watched it all the way through multiple yeah. times. Me, me That's too. how much I enjoyed it. Uh, and he pretty much hits every, every point... Other than the political thing, where he basically just says Doctor Who's always been political, da 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 da, yeah. which I agree with. But again, I would have added a bit more to that. But aside from that, I pretty much agree with that entire video. Like he hits pretty much every nail. Yeah, there was a kind of, there was another because, one by um, Full Fat Videos, I think they're called. Yeah, they did like a video essay about how Series Eleven failed, and what I noticed was quite funny with a lot of. Um, people on youtube is you slowly see them realize that i'm actually not enjoying this series so you see them quite optimistic with the woman who fell to earth but then by the time it gets to the battle of whatever it is still can't pronounce it um just, yeah I that's think. the one i think yeah so by the time they get to that you can just be like they're just sort of like uh, yeah that was that was the finale I think yeah, Harry's that, Moving Castle, funnily enough, is, is one of those people where you see him gradually just lose hope and faith that this would actually be a good series. The thing is with Harry's Moving Castle that you kind of enjoy him being, like, peed off by it. Yeah. Like, that's some of his best work is when he, like, clearly doesn't enjoy what he's watching. Yeah, same with Stu Bagful as well, I think. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, th- I, th- I don't know what it is. I think I've said this before, but for some reason people always seem to be more drawn to the negative side of things. Because if oh, you're yeah, just like, oh, this was amazing, it's just like, yeah, it was. But if you're ranting and raving about it, I think that's why channels like Bolstrek, for example, they probably are getting the views that they are because people know that he's not going to like what he's talking about and they just want to hear somebody be angry for three or four minutes or, you know, whatever it is. I mean, a lot of people I imagine who watch his channel, I mean, a lot of them will agree with what he's saying, but I imagine a lot of them are just like, yeah, but this guy's entertaining because he's ranting and he's, you know, he's raving. Yeah. It's funny to hear this guy just flip his lid about stuff. I mean, yeah, like, I took quite a bit, of, you know, inspiration from him in that sense because he was kind of one of those people that I saw that was just speaking his mind. Like, whatever you say about Bullstring, that's up to you, but he at least says what he what he thinks yeah, you know, that's, directly that's, to you. That is the one thing that I admire about him and, you know, a few other people like that because the, there are people... I feel at least who are kind of a. Fr- I'm not going to name any names, but there are people that comes across to me anyway that they look like they're holding back and they look oh, God, like. Mr. Oh, sorry, got something in my throat. <laughs> well, I I didn't hear what you said. Um, I I did, but we'll just ignore it. Um, anyway, <laughs> yeah. So there are people who I do feel like they are holding back on their opinion and they are just sort of like, if I sort of back down and admit that you know, I'm not actually enjoying this as much as I say I am, then people will call me all sorts of things. Um, whereas, I, yeah, I, I always think it's it's better to be honest and it is better to just sort of say what you think. Because, like I say, who gives a shit? Like, if people don't agree with you, so what? Like, it's not... Or if people get offended by your opinion on a TV show, like, so what if you're offended? You're not going to wake up the next morning and just be like, you know what, I was offended and now I have leprosy. Like, it doesn't work like that. It, you know, so, yeah. And, I don't uh, know where I was going no, with you're, that, but... you're totally right, like, that's kind of the thing that I, you know, enjoy about, you know, like, yourself as well, is that even though, obviously, you probably do go through numerous takes, oh, it gotcha. doesn't feel like that. That's the great part. Yeah, I, about... I don't, to be honest. I think quite a few times, I know, well, I, I don't, write videos out or anything i don't plan them they are very spontaneous off the top See, of my I, head. I do for quite a few of mine some of them are just off the cuff admittedly well, it's all some, about, 
it's all about personal style and whatnot. But like I said, yeah. for me, it, it was just like I know what I want to say, so I'm just going to say it. If I if I write it down, it's not going to come across as natural to me. Um, and you're right, there are there are times where I am literally just going off. Um, but yeah. I always have this annoying thing where I'll just like I'll just stutter all over my words, and I'm like, oh, but I was making such a good point. And yeah, it happens to me as well. And the thing is, like, you don't, you, you're hesitant to cut it out because you might cut out something that's, you know, good. Well, I just leave them in for bloopers. Do you leave a little bit of a stutter in and leave the, you know, the good point there? Like, you'll see it in my ranking the doctors. Like, I did a full ranking of the doctors, which did quite well for me, actually. It's almost at 2K, which is pretty good for me. Cool. Um, and, like, even though I agree with what I said in that video and it came across pretty well, there are quite a few moments where I sort of stir. And part of that is just, you know, reading off a script mm. and just, like, uh, reading it and maybe it doesn't come across in the right way, right way. And some of that is just, like, nervousness sometimes because, you know, you're recording and even though you're alone, you feel a sort of pressure to do as good a job as you can you know what i mean yeah it's kind of that whole thing like you don't want to come across as insecure or nervous but at the same time like you never quite know how things are going to be received luckily that video was received pretty well uh and the ranking ones always seem to do pretty good yeah i've I've noticed that it's the same with me but I, i well kind of what we were saying about a second ago as well like the the more negative videos i think always tend to do well as well so i've got best and worst videos of you know whatever it might be m- more than likely doctor who and the, the yeah. worst one always tends to get more views um, yeah and negativity sells that's yeah that's, it, that's it, reality, it does but... it really does but like i say i think when it comes to youtube especially i i think at this point just don't give a shit what people think because as long as you've made a video and you're happy with it then that's all that matters um because i'm not making videos for other people well i I suppose i am but not really i always think of it as just like i've got this opinion and i want to talk about it so i'm just going to put it out there and it's kind of like if people want to watch it and people want to hear a different point of view cool if you don't also cool it's just kind of more for me to be creative yeah no that's fair enough and it's the same with me for the rankings. It's quite cool to actually have those rankings there to see how I actually rank things. And it's also it's... a good way to show how your opinions change as well. Because yeah, you could cause... come back to that video and be like, why did I put that one as low as I did? Or why was that one as high as they are? I mean, I know with the ranking with the Doctors, Jody is probably going to stay at the bottom. Like, I doubt that's going to change. Like, unless they pull some voodoo magic in Series 12. And... It- make her the most characterful, unique, interesting doctor ever, but I just don't see it happening. And even if they did do that, you'd still have Series 11 where she's just boring as sin. That's true, but, I mean, like I say, Sylvester's first series, I think, is probably worse than Series 11, and yet I really love his character and his development across his three seasons. So it could happen. I mean, when I was a kid, David Tennant was my favourite doctor. Now he's one of my least favourite. Yeah, I had that same thing where it's like, because uh, my first like real Doctor was with David Tennant, I was like, oh yeah, David Tennant's great. Uh, but as time's gone on, I'm like, Paul McGann for me is like the quintessential Doctor. Like, when you sort of... But I obviously there's, you know, certain extremes like on both sides. Obviously you got Tom Baker's my second favourite, which obviously you can relate to because I believe he's your favourite, isn't he? Yeah. Because <laughs> you've got that cut out in your room. Nah, it's not a cut out. It's actually him. I've kidnapped him. <laughs> You've actually kidnapped Tom yeah. You got a time machine. Got him when he was actually playing the fourth Doctor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Please help and, me. He won't let me go. And locked him away in Shut your up, room. Tom. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Tell uh, Tom I said hi. Yeah, we don't talk. No, <laughs> uh, for me, Paul McGann's the quintessential mm. like Doctor. He embodies all the traits that I think the Doctor should have. Uh, I will admit, like, it is a shame that we only got one movie out of him, but I do have a huge soft spot for that movie. Yeah, I really like the TV movie as well. Like, I fully admit that Eric Roberts is ridiculous. Yeah. And I fully admit that him spitting Venom doesn't make any sense. 
but I still love. <laughs> no, that was bizarre where he's turned into a snake and it's just how over the top camp he is. Like even in the sixties that would have looked out of place. Some yeah, of the stuff was... that he does in there, but apparently he's been doing big finish apparently. Yeah, I've heard and I, I haven't heard any reviews, but I imagine it's going down quite well because people seem to be enjoying those audios. I don't well, like he, say, well, he I... apparently I imagine he'd have an actual understanding of the character. <laughs> Yeah, somebody probably sat him down and was just like, what you did before, that that was good, um, but do everything apart from what you were doing in that, and you'll be fine. <laughs> so, I still do think that he is a better master than, than Missy, and that's going to be controversial, I know, because I know Missy's got her fans, but to me, Missy's a great character. But she doesn't feel like she, the master. She's No, she's not a great master. Um yeah, you know, I know. Like a lot of people don't like John Sim. He's honestly one of my favorites. Just See, because he was, as... hmm? he was for me. Yeah. Um, but I think it's kind of the tenant thing. I think once I sort of outgrew tenant, I outgrew John Sim as well. But John Sim was one of those that actually had the opposite effect. He, I didn't grow out of it. He actually grew on me. I mean, I must I admit know. his performance in series ten is is pretty good, considering how little he was actually given. Yeah, it would have been cool to actually have him be more of a focus. Like, I feel like they should have either focused on just the Cybermen or just the Masters. Like, don't do both. Yeah, because either way, either thing. way, you undermine them, don't you? If you have, you know, both of them in there. I mean, um, Missy was all right in World Nephew in time when she was just sort of an extended TARDIS member, but you know, as with her as the antagonist and the other Master and the Cybermen as well. I think that's kind of the problem that Doctor Falls had as a second part. It's just they was juggling so much. Yeah. And obviously you had Capaldi leaving, or he was supposed to leave until obviously twice upon a time. Uh, and you had Bill leaving, and it was like there was a Nardo leaving, and there were so many things you had to try and do in, in that one final part. And I just feel like he took on too much, like Moffat tends to do. To be fair, he has all these great ideas, but he just lacks like the ability to fit them all together in a cohesive way sometimes yeah not always but sometimes like uh obviously river song as you mentioned earlier was a great example like in silence of the library forest of the dead she is a really interesting character mm. like you want to know more about her but by uh what was it husbands of river song her last appearance yes i think so. by that point you're just like just die <laughs> yeah just go just, already just go to that library and just die because you know she just she was one of those characters that just kind of got worse as time went on yeah same thing with um what was i gonna say i forgot who i was gonna say now but it'll come back to me at some point same thing with rose that's what i was gonna say yeah yeah like she was good at, like in like she was she served her purpose in like series one being the fish out of water that we could all relate to being someone just like from normal uh, early noughties, you know, Britain. But like, after that, she becomes like the Doctor's equal, but also a lover. Yeah. And it just doesn't work for her, personally. But no, um, I, I know we're, ve we're veering, we're veering off track a little bit. <laughs> but I tell, I, I, that's what I kind of like about podcasts, is that you can sort of talk yeah. about stuff just naturally just have a natural conversation that's kind of what i like about them yeah uh, they are really good they for also, that. plus they're also good for watch time as well uh, yeah <laughs> that mid rolls as well get the ads in well yeah well some point hopefully because <laughs> no monetization for me yet really Nah, you've got to get to a thousand subscribers and i think like four thousand hours of watch time for, for monetization do you yeah Oh, I didn't Which know that. Which sucks for me, because I can't actually make any money. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I, I don't make loads, but... No. Yeah, I, I mean, but it, it would I'm... be nice, like, just to get something. Well, just yeah. To say, just to say, you dedicated your time to this. Good job. I'm pretty sure, though, that when I first started, that wasn't a thing. As in, no, like, it you was... just monetize it from the get-go, but... Yeah, well, it used to be like that. Oh, then there was, like, the adpocalypse, wasn't there, with, like... Yeah, and then they said... And then they went... Well, people are abusing this too much because they can just like make money off of anything. They can have like a one-hit wonder, and then never upload again. Mm. You know what I mean? So they sort of had to make it so that, you know, 
there was a, a thousand subscriber and four thousand hours of watch time threshold. So you couldn't just make one popular video and just never make anything else, which sucks because, again, I've put you know I've only I, admittedly I've only been doing this like six seven months, but at the same time like the time I've put into it in that past six seven months you're like it would be nice just to get some. Th- I'm yeah. not asking for like you know a million pound or anything like that or anything bonkers or insane, but like just. Some sort of slight recognition. The only thing I've got recently is was the email for 500 subscribers. <laughs> it's like, thanks, appreciate that. I didn't even get one of them. If it helps, <laughs> it was... I mean that helps slightly. I mean, I'm getting there now. I'm on like 780 odd. Well, but yeah. The thing that I found is like the first thousand typically are kind of the the hardest one. Um, yeah. Because I got to a point where. Yeah, it it was veering between one number. For, I can't remember the exact number now, but it was like it was just going up over that number and then back down below that. It was just fluttering, and for ages it was stuck like that. And it, I was kind of in a similar position where I was just like, "How many hours of like work do I have to put into this for more people to notice?" And then I, I think you hit a point, and then it just starts to snowball really. And it's it's not always just going to be like you know tens of thousands of people subscribe a day. But nah, I think is I don't even want that. Like it would just be nice just to just to get something for all your effort, you know, especially when you know, like like we put a lot of you know time into it even though you, some people just say oh, it's just YouTube, you're just making silly videos, but it's more than that to people, you know. Uh to some people they do want to make it into a viable source of income type of thing. Yeah. So not even that. I'm not even really looking for that. I just want a little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit, you know. It would be nice. But that's kind of one of the things I was hoping by doing these podcasts with other, other content creators, get people, other, other people on the channel, and then they would kind of help me a little bit, give me a sort of leg up, because obviously your your fans would see me, or my fans might see you, I doubt it, but it's possible. Well, um, you can always link this video. Yeah, I mean, if you could, like, it around. I, I, I'd appreciate it, man, because, yeah, yeah like, I mean, like, the subscribers have been creeping up ever so slowly, but it's just, it is, it has been a struggle. And like, that's another thing. When you're a small content creator like like me, I mean, like under a thousand, it's it's quite daunting to go up to somebody with more because you're like, are they going to think I'm just sort of so amateur that's not worth, not worth their their weight and salt, you know? Yeah, well, that's the thing because it's like I remember one of the people that I, well, the very first YouTuber that. I watched in terms of Doctor Who content was Batman March and for yeah. ages I you know I was watching his content and he's one of the reasons why I actually started doing it and then there was one day where I did a video um talking about it was like a a nomination thing it was like so I, I think Mr Tardis started it some like prize Doctor Who possessions or something and then it went to like Ace Creeper and Counselor Geeks and Stu Bagful yeah and maybe. then they tagged you into it yeah didn't and they? then somebody tagged me well I think both Counselor Geeks and Ace Creeper tagged me and then at the end of my one I tagged back my march and he did his video and he knew my first name which I thought was awesome and then he was like following me on Twitter after that and I was just like oh wow like that's the guy that made me want to start and like he's following me on Twitter and he knows my name and he's actually responded to a video that I did and all this yeah, sort of that's stuff. Yeah, that's the same with me, man. Like, because I've, I've met obviously a lot of people overdoing this over just a short amount of time. Like, that's something the podcast is up as well. Uh, one of my first ones was Harry's Moving Castle. Yeah. So to be able to do a podcast with him when he was such a, like an impact on me as not only a creator but as a person in general was just really cool and obviously i i appreciate you know every guest i have on i've been a fan of pretty much every guest i've had on uh, uh you know at some point and i'm you know i'm a fan of you now like my most recent liked video is your one on uh doctor who hidden gems oh, okay the, one. the way the one you just like released today like Did i that literally go up today I think it did. Oh crap! I thought I scheduled it for tomorrow. <laughs> oh well. I think well, that already the yeah. new Who one, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh crap! I think that was up to. Oh yeah. Uh, it, well, it was going up anyway, so I don't think it matters. But yeah, yeah. Five hours ago, hidden gem Doctor Who stories, new Who. <laughs> right then. Well, no wonder my phone's been buzzing <laughs> the entire time. It must be <laughs> notifications. Yeah. 
saying, oh, so, somebody's commented on your video. Well, I, d- I didn't know it was up. Well, well, yeah, cheers for that, because I didn't, I didn't really know that. Um, yeah. The one thing I will say, like, with um, your, the, the pick for Series 11, obviously you chose Kablam. Like, obviously there's not many other um, ones you honestly could have chosen. Mm. Uh, but, like, I'm pretty sure, I know I'm going to be a bit finicky here, but, like, I'm pretty sure everybody sees that as the best one. So I don't know whether it's as much of a hidden gem as, as like, it's more just, like, the only option you had. Well, I, th- I think I said that in the video, to be honest, because... <laughs> yeah, you pretty much said, like, I guess Kablam. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't going to pick fucking Sananga Conundrum or whatever it's called. Like, <laughs> yes. that was terrible. Lilo and Stitch remake. Yeah, exactly, Stitch on meth. Um, uh. But, yeah... That, that one was a struggle. But, I mean, it's always a struggle, really, when you're trying to pick a Doctor Who story because there's so many that are good or there's so many that are shit. That I mean, that's the beauty about Doctor Who, really. It's the best show and it's also the worst show ever. And I love it. I actually quite like watching stories that are crap. And I don't mean, like, hellbent, whereas in they should be good but they're not. I mean stories like Warriors of the Deep where it's so just awful that I can't help but love it. Yeah, I um had that with a lot of series six. To be fair, like I know it's bad, and I know it's sort of you know a lot of people say, oh, it's it's you know boring and confusing. But I I will always hold a soft spot for the Matt Smith era because it was kind of that one that I watched from start to finish. Mm. Like obviously I was introduced with Tennant, but uh, Matt Smith was a Doctor. I the first Doctor I saw all the way through. Uh, you know, from start to finish, I was there for the entirety of the era, which was probably why I had, uh, you know, why I have a bit of a rose-tinted glasses view on on Matt Smith's era in general, even though I know that there are there are a lot of weak points to it. Yeah, but there, I like to remember, you know, the good points of, of Matt Smith. Like, obviously, series five, I think. Probably one of the best series of New Who. Yeah, I, up, I think it's the we, best. I don't know whether I would put it above series one or series four, but it's up there for me. Like, probably would go series. You know, I would see it would be up in my like top sort of three. Yeah, like I, I can't really argue with that to be honest because they're my top three. Um, yeah, I, I do think that series one is pretty flawless, and I do think that series four is pretty flawless as well. Um, yeah, and series five pretty much follows suit. To be fair, yeah, like Stephen Moffat at his probably best. Yeah, I yeah, say so. Got, like obviously, I know we had the good episodes in, in RTD's era with obviously um, Silence in the Library, Forest in the Dead, Blink, Empty Child, Empty Child, Doctor Dances, and The Girl in the Fireplace. I think he wrote. Did he write that? Yeah, he yeah, did that, write that. that was yeah. a series two one. Yeah, so. Obviously, he had his good points in in the RTD era, but yeah, series five was the first Moffat series, if you like, and it was him at his best trying to prove that he could do everything that RTD could do and keep this show going. Because I can remember, uh, I can't remember which video I watched, but the BBC were actually considering cancelling Doctor Who after after David Tennant. Yeah, I remember hearing about that because so there was not actually a lot of faith in the Moffat era. But with that one series, he was able to prove everybody wrong. And you got to commend the guy for that. Like, he kept the show going. As much as RTD reintroduced it, which is, obviously, I'm forever indebted to him for, because otherwise I'd probably never have found it. Uh, Moffat was the one that kept it going. And arguably led it to its most sort of popular period in terms of, like, worldwide appeal. Because obviously we had the whole BBC America thing. So, Yeah. Uh, but I do have a soft spot for the Matt Smith era. You know, I think I always probably will. Uh, even though, obviously, Series 6 is... Whilst it has its good spots, like... Is Doctor's Wife Series 6? It is, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Because that's one of my favourite episodes of New Who. Like, they, I love that it explores the dynamic of the Doctor and the TARDIS. I feel like that's something that needs to be explored a bit more. Because really what we've... The only things I remember are Doctor's Wife... Journey to the Centre is the TARDIS, and that's about it. In, oh, terms, right. in terms of TARDIS stuff, like, can you remember any, like, TARDIS-centric plot lines? Um, in New Who, do you mean? Just generally. 
Uh, the Invasion of Time has stuff like that. Uh, yeah. I've never been a big fan of Invasion of Time, not going to lie. Oh, I <laughs> love it. I, that's another one that I was saying before where I, I understand it's bad, but I just can't help but love it. Um, it's one of those, like, obviously, it has Tom Baker and it has Leela, which I really enjoy. I enjoy that chemistry, but it just drags. That's yeah. the only thing, like... I, I like the idea of, you know, you know, all that stuff in that episode, but it just goes on for so long, and it's like... And I mean, I, I've heard people have that same argument for Genesis. Genesis doesn't feel long to me. Like, I don't know whether I'm just sort of... Because no, I can't I, even say yeah. I'm... Because I can't even say I'm blinded by nostalgia in that case, because I didn't really grow up with Tom Baker as the Doctor. So I yeah. can't say that. So I think I just, it's one of those stories that is just sort of really good, and it keeps you gripped. Obviously it's, uh, obviously it's just a good introductory, like, thing for uh, the Daleks, yeah. and obviously Davros as well. I mean, not the Daleks, Davros, I meant. Well, technically it is an introduction to the Daleks. I suppose, yeah, I mean... For a lot of people, it probably would have been like, yeah, back in the day. Oh, well, maybe because I know that the last three Pertwee seasons, each one had a Dalek story. But uh, yeah, but if some... you jumped on with Baker, yeah, that's true. Or like if, if you, you went back only to visit the classics, it with... yeah, you probably would go back and watch them. But like, I mean, what an introduction Genesis would be. Like, cut didn't get much better than that in terms of classic who. I kind of wrestle between that and Remembrance in terms of my favourite classic. I know you're a fan of Resurrection. Uh, I think yeah. you said Resurrection is your favourite. Yeah, out the 80s stories, yeah. Yeah. Well, 80s Dalek stories specifically, yeah. I, in, terms I of classics, in terms of classic stories in general, which one would you probably pick? Are, we, ta Dalek, yeah? are we talking favourite or best? Favourite. Favourite's the Hand of Fear. Oh, I meant in terms of Daleks. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, in terms of Dalek yeah. stories. Uh, ooh. Um, that is tough. I'm just trying to think. I, I probably would say Genesis, but that's probably because I revisit it the most. I do revisit Genesis a lot. Then again, I do revisit Remembrance a lot as well. Yeah. Because that kind of has McCoy and uh, Sophie Aldred at their best as well. Yeah, that's true. And we've got Unit... Uh, reintroduction of Totter's Lane, cool stuff like that. Uh, Hand of Omega, bunch of cool stuff in that episode. Yeah, that's true. But again, Genesis is more sort of tightly, like scripted. I think. I think it's probably one of the darkest Dalek stories as well. Genesis is, yeah. Yeah, and that's like, what I like episode, about it. I think it was Clever Dick Films that said that before then the Daleks were kind of a joke. They were, yeah. they were sort of losing their threateningness and like with uh, Genesis they brought that back and you can definitely tell that because they go for all black Daleks like you know they're not because the first time we see the Daleks they're all grey and blue I mean they were blue but you can't tell on well, a black yeah. TV obviously but um, with Genesis they're all black which just like it's just a dark color in general, um, and that entire story is pretty dark. It pretty much only takes place in uh, the Khaled base, uh, the outside, uh, the sort of Scaro, the main like surface of Scaro, yeah, and the Thal sort of base with the rocket. So there's only really three main places that they go. Yeah, but I think, that, and it's all really grey and dingy and horrible yeah, that's, and that's harrowing kind of, and yeah, yeah exactly that's like one of the best examples of using a quarry well yeah that because it uh, looks yeah. like something something that is war torn well I, to be fair i do quite like the fact that they use um in the hand of fear a quarry to be actually a quarry i did quite like that i think that was like a little nod <laughs> to the fact that docs who uses quarries all the time but yeah no you're right um with, with genesis as well there's a lot of Nazi-esque imagery as well, which is quite interesting. But I mean, yeah, fair, even more clear than I like, even like probably the most clear the allegory between the the Daleks and the Nazis has ever been. Yeah, obviously have um, 
Nida, who helps Davros, who's very clearly like German inspired. Yeah. Well, they all are really. They've all got their big boots and their sort of hand gesture that yeah, they all the little do. salutes and whatnot. Yeah. So yeah, they, they you know, so I can definitely see it. But that's uh, in terms of my favorite classic story in general, though. There's quite a few because I'll always have a soft spot for Two of the Cybermen because that was my first classic. Yeah, that is a great story in yeah, general. I agree. It's one of those ones that I do revisit a lot. Uh, Pyr- Pyramids of Mars is another fantastic one. That's a great one. Sutek is a villain that I would actually love to see come back. See, I don't. I'm I'm much rather in the boat of just leave him in pyramids because I don't want the chance that he could possibly get ruined. Could uh, you imagine if Sutek comes back for series twelve? Oh god! Under the guidance of Chibnall, they'd probably make him a white guy, wouldn't they? Well, yeah, probably. Probably trying to enslave all the black people. I, I could just see him trying to do something like that. <laughs> Krasko was actually suits. Oh my god. <laughs> like you could, the Pating was really Sutek all along. <laughs> I could see him doing that as well. Oh Christ. It's not out of the realm of the possibility for Chibnall. That's the scariest part. Like the, the Doctor Who universe is his oyster. Which is scary, but... Yeah, Pyramids of Mars I love. What else do I obviously remember I told you about? Yeah. Earthshock's pretty good. Oh, I love Earthshock. I don't think it's as good as Tomb. Like, obviously, you say how great the Earthshock Sidemen are in that video where you talk about the uh, Earthshock head. Which, by the way, I am pretty jealous of the Earthshock head. I just thought I'd point that out. It is pretty uh, I love it. It is pretty cool. <laughs> it's sat looking at me at the minute. Yeah. It's like, yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I can remember when... Uh, the Montassian side men when they were rumoured to come back I can remember everyone saying oh yeah it'd be great to see them back I would love to see the tomb ones come back Cause yeah, I think they are a really good design I, to be fair in terms of the classic era apart from maybe revenge I don't think the Cybermen had a bad design nah well I, I say I say, I, I know you've got a soft spot for the Earthshock ones but I do think I think it's more the voices more than anything I know that you like the voices but to me, they are just a little bit too emotional. I get what you mean, because it's like, I tried to get my girlfriend to watch Earthshock. Um, I mean, she is a Doctor Who fan, but she's sort of watching it from the beginning onwards, and she's only yeah. midway through Pertwee at the minute. But I was just like, no, I want you to watch Earthshock. We got to that reveal at the end of part one, where it's like, destroy them at once, and she <laughs> pissed herself laughing at the voices. Because like, she's used to the Troughton ones, like the... The tomb ones, the ones I've... that are really modulated, like yeah, really where you can heavy. barely understand them. So to go from like "you will become like us" to destroy them, and it was just kind of like excellent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She just started pissing herself laughing, and I was just like, "Well, you're sleeping on the street tonight." <laughs> I didn't laugh when I first saw them, but I just thought that it kind of went in the face of what the type of men were to me. Like they're supposed to be these emotionless things, well. And- I mean, I saw them before I saw any other Cybermen, so that's probably why I don't well, that's, feel that way. That's but... the thing with, well, at first I saw the Cybers ones, but then I saw the, the, the Tomb ones. The Tomb ones left a much bigger impact on me, to be fair. Uh, because Next Doctor, even though, again, I'll have a soft spot for it, because it's the first one that I watched. And I think somewhere I've got a signed picture of Rosita that somebody gave me. That's all oh, right, okay. Some Somewhere, I don't know where. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll always have a soft spot for that story, but I can't deny that there's elements of that story that are ridiculous. Like there's cyber dogs, and there's oh, like. Oh god, yeah, I forgot what are they called? The cyber, cyber shades? shades? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, there's the cyber shades, and they've got. Um, what's that woman's name? The oh, one. I, the I one... know the actress name, but I can't think of Something... the character name. I can't remember what she's probably called. Probably Lady Summit in it. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be Lady Summit. But she was like, you know, she was like screaming at the Cybermen, and they were all going, Arr! Arr! and that massive Cyber King. I think it was. Wasn't that it? was actually quite cool. I know. I know it's it's a, it's an effect that aged terribly. Oh, like God, yeah. you can tell it's not there, but at the same time, as a kid, that was really cool watching it rise up from the Thames. I'll always have like that imagery of it just sort of rising up and then all running away from it. That's quite cool. But yeah, the team of the Simon ones probably left a much bigger impact purely because of how modulated they were. And how sort of you could tell that they were at one point human, but they're not anymore. 
And that's kind of the thing that people like about the Mondasian ones. However, I would argue that the two ones actually do it a little bit better than the Mondasian ones. I know people love the Mondasian ones, but the Mondasian ones are a little bit too clunky. Like, the cloth face, I know, is, is intimidating, and it is. But at the same time, like, you feel like you could put a bullet through that relatively easily. Fair point, actually. I hadn't like, thought of that. With the tomb ones, they are supposed to be all metal. So if you try and fire a bullet at that, it's gonna it's gonna be um much more difficult. Whereas with the Mondasian ones, they're all cloth, so you just go. Yeah, that's uh, a very the Brigadier would have had a field day with those ones. Jack yeah, with the handlebars, have... five rounds rapid. <laughs> yeah. Come on, Doctor. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. Well, that's probably why the Sidemen didn't appear in the third Doctor's era, just because yeah. the Brigadier just blow the bloody face off. Exactly. <laughs> Although, we did get to see them face off with the third Doctor and the five Doctors, which was always quite oh, cool. Oh yeah, that's true. I mean, it wasn't as much as a face off as it was letting that... He was just sort of off. looking at them get destroyed. <laughs> By, um, what's it called? Uh, Raston Warrior Robot. The Warrior Robot, yeah. They kind of picked a catchy name for it, really. Like... I mean, I know what it is, but it's like, it could have been like something cooler than that. But yeah, but we did kind of see them interact anyway, which is cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I can understand why obviously you like the Earthshot ones, because they were the first ones. But for me, obviously, Tomb was the first classic story I saw. So there was always that appeals to me, which, you know, my first two stories were actually Cybermen ones. So I watched, I, I knew about the Cybermen before the Daleks. Well, I say I knew, I knew what Daleks were. But in terms of stories, like, uh, my first two Doctor Who stories were Cyberman ones. Mm. Uh, which is why I've always had a soft spot for the Cyberman. Even though I prefer the Daleks like most people do, I hold the Cyberman in higher regard than I think a lot of people do. Even though they're pretty much near the top all the time in Doctor Who rankings. Yeah, they're either I, one or two, aren't they? Or at the I very do, least, three. I do so. see a lot of people say, oh, they're little bit stupid at times and they're just they're just sort of robots sometimes which to be honest that's something that the new series kind of did particularly with nightmare and silver where they were basically just robots yeah that's true which does kind of rob them of their sort of what made them so threatening and, and appealing in the first place yeah that's kind of the same with the dalek in resolution they made it laugh Oh, okay. Did you, did, I, I no, I haven't seen that. Well, yeah, they actually made it laugh. And I I personally didn't like that because the only time we saw a Dalek laugh before was with Dalek, um, Khan. Dalek Khan. And that was because he was insane. Mm. So that made sense. With this Dalek, it was like he was just laughing. It's like, but Daleks don't laugh. Unless it's so, some sort of like sick, sadistic, like, I'm going to murder you. Type but even laugh. that, like that, the only emotion they're supposed to feel is hate. Like, but I, I suppose if you hate something that much, you would laugh because you'd find joy out of it. But um, that kind but of. But I don't know whether they're to... supposed to find joy. Yeah. <laughs> just that I don't think they're supposed to enjoy killing things. I just think that's what their natural instinct's supposed to be. Yeah, I suppose. It's kind of like I don't know. It's kind of like finding something to eat. Like when you're at a shop, you're not laughing trying to trying to find something to eat. It's just something you got to do. Yeah, <laughs> sort of fair, yeah, fair point. Natural instinct, you know? But that's yeah. kind of what Davros did in, in Genesis, was that was kind of their natural desire to kill, as Davros says. Uh, and obviously, he he doesn't like the fact that the guy interfered with it. But yeah, that's another tangent there. <laughs> How long did we feel just talking about Cybermen? I, d I have no idea. That, that was quite a while. I've not been keeping track of time, to be honest. I mean, it says on the Skype call we've been talking for an hour and 53. Oh, wow. So, uh, that's quite impressive. <laughs> what? Well, I did not realise that. I, I mean, I know the first 10 minutes was about, like, pretty much before we recorded. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's, again, the thing I love about podcasts is you just sort of lose track of time. Um, but no, it is really good, like, talking to you because I do feel like we come from pretty similar... We have very similar like few points, yeah. And we had very similar points in time where we were done in the done with the show, obviously yeah. with series series nine. And I completely understood your stance in 
that video you did, I think it's called I'm Done With Doctor Who. Oh, yeah. Where you essentially just say, look, I'm not carrying on with this. And I can completely understand that because uh, when you've been let down so many times, <laughs> there's only so many times you can be let down before you're like, nah. Yeah, exactly. The, the way that I think um, about it is if in your, if you're in a relationship with somebody and that happens, you wouldn't stick with that person just because yeah. you love them. You know, you you have yeah. to think what's better for you, and it's like I, I don't want to keep lowering my opinion of Doctor Who, if that makes sense, by seeing more of it when it's shit. But the, yeah, I know people always say like, oh, but well, you're not a real fan. It's like, yeah, I am. Like, if I wasn't Just a real you fan, don't, like one part of it doesn't make yeah. you not feel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like that's I'll... ridiculous. Like, I'm not a huge fan of the Pertwee era, honestly. Like, oh, really? It's kind of controversial, I know, but I much prefer the sort of out there space adventures that Tom Baker had. And yeah, I can Trout see that. Had, to the sort of earthbound Bond affairs that yeah, I get, we has. I and get like, that. Like, they they are classics. Obviously, You've got the Sea Devils and stuff like that. There are you know, classics in their own right, but for me, I'd much prefer, like, Space Odysseys as as opposed to his unit, here's the Brigadier. Oh, look, we're being invaded again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, that's, that's kind of the thing with the Pertwee era, it's kind of the same structure. I mean, you could argue that about Troughton, but I feel like yeah, true. with Troughton, it was a bit more... I suppose like, there's more variety, isn't there? Yeah, there was a bit more variety there. Uh, but what was I going to say? Closing thing. Uh, the thing, a problem that, uh, the, like my last point as well in regards to series eleven is, part of the problem is that Jodie Whittaker is actually the face of the brand, uh, which sucks for a lot of people because it kind of puts you off the show in a sense, when you know the 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 brand is you know part you know, the, the brand is. The, what the brand represents, you don't necessarily like. You know? Yeah, I get. Yeah, um, I get what you mean. It's kind of like you know what you what uh, I can't remember who said it now, but like when you see Jodie's Whittaker's place face plastered on all the merchandise and posters, and it just kind of leaves a sour taste there in your mouth. You know. I mean, um, I don't mind that as such, just because she's the current <laughs> Doctor. But the one that really gets me is when you see her logo on classic series stuff. Yeah, I don't like that either. I hate that, and it's not just because it's Jodie's logo before anyone jumps in the comments. It's purely because none of those doctors had that logo. Like, I much prefer either, for classics at least, the Diamond logo, um, the logo that was used for Pertwee in the Paul McGann movie, or yeah, that one. the respective logo for that doctor. That's what I like. I, if it's, you know, if they use the Tenant logo, for example, on like a, I don't know, a Peter Davison product, they, I wouldn't like it. They actually like did it. that, didn't they? They did re-release classic stories with the, the modern logo on it. Yeah, they, and, I, and I hated it. It, yeah. it just doesn't look right. Um, no, I agree with you. I, when I look for classic stories online and stuff, I always look for the ones that uh, got all the roundels on them and stuff. Yeah, but, uh, I, I like that uniform quality with the stuff that I've got. You know, So with the classic DVDs, I like the fact that they all do have that same Paul McGann Pertwee logo. Um, if you know randomly throughout when they were releasing them, if they suddenly had like Matt Smith's logo on there, I'd just be a bit like, oh no, my OCD is gonna go mental. It's like yeah, it doesn't fit uniform. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't like fit with the rest of your collection. Yeah, is you know one of them's like that and the other ones like that. But what I mean is like, I know a lot of people complain about things like Captain Marvel, but like she's not the only character of the brand. Yeah, she's not the main character. She's just one cog in the machine, so to speak. Whereas with Jodie Whittaker, she is the character that the show's named after. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Which but, I mean, like I say, it's it's probably only because she is the current Doctor. Yeah, um, and I I don't mind it as much because it's not like I don't see all the other Doctors on things as well. But I yeah, suppose it's, it's not like what you when you realize when you go back and watch classic stories and you just think, oh, this is what it's building up to. Yeah, I do get that. I think the one thing about the branding, apart from the logo, um, of this current iteration that I don't like is how over-the-top colourful it feels. Um, what, the logo? Not, the... not the logo, I'm, um, as in, like, the sort of the posters that they release is always really bright and vibrant and colourful. And I'm... Yeah, I can I can send you a really good example on that. On my Twitter like page, I posted a picture of a Doctor Who magazine I saw. Oh, it, yeah, I think I saw that. 
you might have seen it, but it's like colors everywhere and it's all pink and rainbowy and it's like this, yeah, this is... it, it doesn't really feel see if I can Doctor find that Who-y Who-y to me I, I always uh, like with Doctor Who to advertise it itself in you know like blues and purples like the Vortex for example yeah um, well that's kind of what my logo is kind of sort of a Vortex yeah, with yeah exactly like that a diamond logo in the middle yeah uh, which someone else actually designed but it's, <laughs> it is the perfect design ah, and right. I probably, somebody else did mine as well and I probably won't change it <laughs> because it's like again if it ain't broke don't fix it well yeah, yeah. But that should be the the tagline on this podcast because it's been said a lot. If it ain't broke, it has. don't fix. Hey, we started with it, and we said it in the middle, and then <laughs> yeah, towards but... the end, that's what we're saying. Yeah, that's kind of our thing. And Chibnall kite came in and fixed something that one broke. Exactly. Well, fix it. He fixed it. Well, he, he broke it more. <laughs> he, bro- he broke it more, and then said, "Hey, look, guys, series twelve. We're gonna bring back the things you love." And then he's gonna break. Yeah, those. like Jadoon with a mohawk. Yeah. I mean, I don't mind them having a mohawk necessarily, really. but I just don't see a big deal about the Jadoon coming back. Like, uh, you know, would that be a big deal, you know, five years ago? No, probably not. You know, that's what I said with Tahari. I was like, is that really what it's come down to now? Like, we're all getting hyped over the bloody Jadoon. Yeah, exactly. Is that, is that how low this series has sunk <laughs> that it takes the Jadoon to get us excited? You know, or you know, the Jadoon never like even jumped out to me as that big of a villain. Oh, I don't even they, think they were a villain, really. No, they were just sort of the police. Yeah, it's kind of like if I don't know. Say, for example, uh, you watch the bill, and then you and then you say, "Oh, look, the police are coming back." So it's, <laughs> it's like, well, of course they're coming back. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know that the Jadoon aren't the only characters in Doctor Who. You understand my point, like... Yeah, yeah. It's not that big a deal. No, it's, not it's, like, big... it's like the Ood, or something like that. It's just like... But even, like, with the Ood, at least, like, they, they were a villain kind of, at some yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. Did you do, and they were just sort of the... Fleet. Like, sometimes they were misguided, uh, but they were always trying to do the right thing. Whereas yeah. with the Ood, at least, they could be corrupted, and that was quite a cool, cool idea. Uh, especially Planet of the Ood. Planet of the Ood... Probably one of my hidden gems, personally, if I was to do a list. Uh, I, don't I, I was hear... thinking about that one, to be fair. Because I wasn't... I don't hear a lot of people talking about it. Uh, which sucks for me, because I think it tackles issues like like slavery and uh, cons- like consumerism as well. Because of the, they sell them and uh, they they make uh, a reference to sweatshops and things. Yeah. So that that, that actually covers a political topic... Uh, you know, be, uh, being forced to work and stuff, which is what I think Kablam tried to do, but then they were like, nah, nah, the the corporation's the good guy. Yeah, that's very true. The corporation can never do anything bad, whereas in Planet of the Ood... The corporation the... becomes the Ood. Or, well, that guy did, at least, anyway. Yeah, like, you know, they, they were seen as the bad people. And that dude who was running the operation got his comeuppance. And I think that woman who portrayed the Doctor and Donna died. The the, yes. the, black, the black woman who was working for the head guy. Yeah, yeah, nope, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> I never really understood, like, you know, I can understand what Kablam was going for with the whole sort of, uh, you know, the workplace thing, the whole Amazon sort of thing. But then... They abandon that by saying it that they're, they're the good guy. So even that, which is considered by many to be the best series eleven has to offer, has a pretty terrible message. If you're unhappy with your work situation, don't do anything about it. Otherwise, you're going to be blown up with a bunch of bubble wrap. Well, if it ain't broke, then don't fix it. <laughs> <laughs> but like the the thing is, with the Kablan, they made a point to. To say that it was broke, but yeah, the guy who tried to fix it was the one who was in the wrong. Yeah, that's so, true. There you go. But I just sent you that tweet that I, I was talking about the. Uh, the oh Mac- yeah, cover. yeah, I did, I did see that one. That I, I took a picture of that when I was in W. H. Smith because I was just sort of 
bewildered, like, is, is that what they're trying to go for now? Like, I mean, I mean, like, they got rainbows everywhere, which I don't want to get political again, but, like, it's sort of, it does sort of uh, signify, you know, things. It could just be that they wanted to have rainbows, but to me, like, I feel like, I might just be overanalyzing it, but the fact yeah, that there's rainbows absolutely. everywhere... The way that yeah. I see it is I always thought that Doctor Who was fairly... Um, Universal anyway. Yeah, sort of neutral with the way that it advertised itself, where it does now feel like it's pushed towards a more female demographic. Which I mean, I mean I that's thought... not a problem if that's what you're going for, but Doctor Who's always been a show for everybody. I mean, I, I always thought... thought that the merchandise anyway was more aimed at males. Like, really? if females... I I personally think that like if a female enjoys it that's great. But I always thought because like if you think about it, I know this is getting to gender stereotypes, but all the merchandise is up till series eleven was normally all blue and and stuff like that, which are traditionally male colours. Obviously, I know. Yeah, I suppose. If a, girl, if a girl likes blue, no, that's fine. But you know, it was all traditionally packaged in a way that was more appealing to boys. And anyway, things like monsters are more appealing to boys generally in the broad spectrum. Like, of course, there are going to be girls who enjoy monsters, but grand scheme of things, they're appealed more to males. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, I can see that. But, like, the actual show itself, I always thought was a family show. Yeah. Well, and that's what I mean. It's a show for everybody, young or old, yeah. male or female, black or white, whoever. Um, I didn't. I didn't ever think that it was supposed to be a political drama. <laughs> That's never what I thought it was. And I can understand what Tribunal was trying to do. He was trying to say, oh, well, I'm bringing back the pure historicals. But there's a reason they got rid of the pure historicals. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, uh, I always like those stories where it's like a major event and the Doctor is somehow the cause of it. So, like, the Visitation is a really good example of that. Um, yeah. Where the Doctor's actually the reason for <laughs> causing the Great Fire of London. And even um, the, uh, the um, what do you call it, the crack in time, even though, again, that was one of the conclusions that was pretty poor, the fact that the TARDIS, you know, was tearing cracks in time and it was having all these negative consequences yeah. was quite a cool idea, like, and it was entirely the Doctor's fault. Uh, you know, even uh, Gallifrey coming back, obviously, it was done terribly in Hellbent. But, again, that was entirely down to the Doctor's influence. So I can understand, like, where you're coming from with that, definitely. When the Doctor's at fault, it is actually quite interesting. And yeah. even the time war with the episode Dalek, you know, the Dalek sees the Doctor... How is, how is it any different? You know? Because in, 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 in its head, I suppose, they're not that different. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's like, like we were saying before with Wonder Woman. It's not black and white. It, there are grey areas there. Whereas Moffat just went into Day of Doctor and went, all the Time Lords were very good. and <laughs> Let, Let's just ignore those evil ones from David Tennant's last one. Yeah, no, they were all, they were all perfect and good and just... And all the Daleks were all evil and they... You know, there was never any grey area. And the hybrid arc was just... Oh, don't get me started on the hybrid arc. <laughs> yeah, whatever that was, then... It's just that. Moffat completely butchered the Time War and Gallifrey, is, you know, to be honest. Like, there's, 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 there's so many better things you could have done with it. But instead, no. All the Time Wars are perfect. It's kind of like that whole thing with the Daleks and the Thals, isn't it? Like... I find the Daleks and the Thals much more interesting when they're both wrong. Whereas, obviously, in... Yeah, 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 like in Genesis, whereas in, like, like the, the, the 60s stuff, it is sort of, like, the they were heroic good. archetypes, but, and yeah, then, you know, the evil Daleks and what have you. Yeah, but so basically, Moffat made the Time War way less interesting. Yeah, that's true. Which sucks. Um, but, you know, maybe, maybe series... 12 or Chibnall's era in general if it does carry on past series 12 I have heard news to the contrary uh, you know saying that series 12 will be his exit you know this, his final barrel so to speak uh, but if you know there is a series 13 and stuff I hope that maybe he gets into the swing of things perhaps you're right perhaps this is just a series 24 
and we've got series 25 and 26 to look forward to, you know? But Who's to say? Pardon the pun. But, yeah, it, it very well may, may be, but only time will tell, I suppose. Uh, yeah, it will. Um, but, I, I mean, again, series 26 did end in the show's cancellation. So, as much as I say... Yeah, that, good point, that it, actually. That it could be good, and it could be like series 25 and 26, that did still end in cancellation. So. And I know that, obviously, there's the whole ratings debate and stuff, but I think it was like a 45 to 50% drop across the series. And, like, you can say what you want. Like, of course, a drop is going to be natural. But I don't think 45 to 50% is good. And, like, I think Resolution only had, like, 5 million viewers. Something like that, yeah. Considering it was supposed to be a festive special as well, where they're, they're traditionally the ones that do the best. You know, it's probably shifting uh, it from Christmas to New Year's. That's probably what did it. Yeah, well, that's Chibnall's fault, isn't it? <laughs> He's the one who made that decision. And plus it had the Daleks in it. The Daleks are supposed to be the the big, the top, you know, the big cheese, the top thing, you know? Yeah, and and no one was interested, and I think that's really telling, to be honest. That despite it bringing back the most iconic villain, they still couldn't salvage decent ratings. Um, so what's the Jadoom really gonna do? <laughs> yeah, very very fair point. But um, I think that's that about wraps it up. Okay, I know we've been we've been going at it pretty solid for quite some time now, but um. If you guys did enjoy this and you want to see more Theris podcasts, I'll do them anyway because I like I like talking to people uh, and I like meeting cool people. So, uh, but thank you very much for coming on, uh, Wingy. Yeah, no problem. Appreciate that appreciate that a lot. Yeah, no worries. Uh, thank you again, for having me. That's all right. It's a pleasure. But um, as always, everybody, like, comment, subscribe. Go subscribe to Wingy. Uh, he does probably better content than you'll find over here. So, oh, go I don't over, know about that. Go over there. <laughs> but you know, maybe show show your boy some love as well. Show me some love. You know, there's a little big red button down there. If you press it, then it might end the universe, but it might just. It might... Good things will happen. Yeah, good things will happen. Hopefully, in theory. Uh, thank you all for watching. And I'll see you all later.